Да, Камил. Good morning, Dr. Glenn. How are you? I'm doing quite well. Good. You can see me, you can hear me. Excellent. That's what we want to check. Great. Okay. Well, uh, we seem to be doing fine. So then I will take a break and get back a couple of minutes before 8.30 and do my pre do my pre uh, presentation check right now and prepare for the presentation. All right. Sounds good. Great.
Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me, Dr. Glad? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we'd like to welcome Dr. Gleb. Um, Dr. Gleb was lauded as office whisperer and hybrid expert by the New York Times for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. He serves as the CEO of the Future of Work consulting firm, Disaster Avoidance Experts. Dr. Gleb wrote seven best-selling books, including Return to Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. It's the first book on returning to the office and leading hybrid teams after the pandemic. He also published over 650 articles in prominent venues, such as Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. His cutting-edge thought leadership was translated into Chinese, German, Russian, Korean, Polish, Spanish, Vietnamese, French, and other languages. Dr. Gleb's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting and training. His clients include Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his academic background as behavioral scientist. Dr. Gleb taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor of Ohio State. Dr. Gleb is a proud Ukrainian American and lives in Columbus, Ohio. In his free time, he spends abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. Um, so to help take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked him to share with us um, about seizing leadership in a hybrid and remote via cognitive science for IT, GRC, and auditing professionals. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Gleb. Um, please give uh, him a warm, a warm welcome. Um, in addition, after the um, presentation, um, as always, our CPs will be awarded a week after, within a week um, after the presentation, we will send the emails out for your CPs. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Gleb. Go ahead. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, Camille. And thank you everyone for coming to learn about how to seize leadership in hybrid and remote work. For you as IT professionals, as GRC professionals, as auditing professionals, all of these topics. Now, I've helped 24 companies transition to hybrid and remote work, including many IT companies. I mentioned working with Xerox, Applied Materials, which is a high-tech manufacturing company, is another one of my clients, and there are a number of others. I won't go into depth on all of them. I've also presented on this topic to many ISACA chapters, including ISACA New York City, ISACA Northwest Ohio, ISACA Los Angeles. Some have great familiarity with ISACA audiences, and Osaka, Harrisburg, many others. And I can tell, I know what is beneficial for Osaka members. And of course, I'll be happy to go into more depth and answer your questions. So we'll be a smallish group here. So whenever you feel like you have a question that you want to ask, please put your question into the chat and I'll get to it during the next break. So the structure of the presentation, just so you know what you can anticipate, is that first, we'll talk about the framing, how we think about hybrid work and remote work. That's going to be the first part of the presentation. It's going to be relatively brief. Then we'll both talk about the data. So a lot of data about the research on what do we actually know about hybrid work and remote work? What are the implications for things like retention and productivity engagement and so on? We'll also then talk about the kind of mistakes that leaders tend to make when they think about hybrid work and remote work. And finally, we'll talk about some best practices on hybrid work and remote work. Now, just so that you know the structure of the presentation, what we do is it will be modular based. And after every module, we will have a discussion, a group discussion, so with breakout rooms. So be prepared to engage with your fellow members Isaka chapters in a discussion where in the breakout room here, you should keep your microphone off. You're welcome to put your video on or off, whatever you prefer. But in the breakout rooms, 
please make sure to actually turn on your microphones, turn on your video cameras, if you possibly can at all. I know some of you might have be in a situation where it's hard to turn on the video camera, but maybe consider using a background screen because it's really helpful for that discussion. In the discussion, what you'll be doing is I will give you a prompt to discuss. Then you'll discuss it. Well, the first thing you'll do is you'll select someone who will report out to the broader group on your discussion. So you'll select someone who is a reporter, and then that person will be taking notes on the discussion. And then after we come back from the broader group discussion, from the smaller group discussion, breakout rooms into the broader group, the reporter will report out, and then we'll have a broader group discussion on each of the topics. So that will be the modular framework that we'll be using that will help you get the information and then learn how to apply it in the context of what Isaka chapter members actually want and need. And that will be really helpful to you because I know a lot of the beneficial learning. So I'm presenting to you broad information that's applicable, of course, to IT, GRC, and auditing professionals. But what you'll get in those groups is peer-to-peer -peer learning where you actually learn from the perspective of your peers how it practically applies to the kind of work they do. And you'll be able to get some reflection on what's happening with you and how you can improve things in your own context. So please make sure to engage thoroughly and inclusively in that discussion to be comprehensive, to be vulnerable. You know, nobody, whatever stuff happens in the breakout room, stays in the breakout rooms, obviously you can say, tell people that you don't want to share something and they will not share publicly. All right. Now, before we proceed, are there any questions? I should mention, we'll be having breaks, 10-ish minute breaks every hour. If we go a little bit longer than an hour, if because there's an intense discussion, I'll make it a 15 minute break. In the middle, we'll have a lunch break for about an hour. So you'll have time to take breaks. So you don't need to worry about checking your email during the presentation. So please consider avoiding doing that because you'll have plenty of breaks when you can check your email. You want to really be fully engaged with what's going on here. Okay, with that information in mind, are there any questions before we proceed? You can unmute yourself if you have a question or you can put it in the chat. I'll give you a few seconds to think about. Oh, I should mention there will be polling throughout the presentation. So please make sure to respond to the polls. You'll be able to see them pop up and then there will be a poll, you will respond to it, and that will be form part of the discussion. All right, so questions. Um, anything before we actually proceed into the presentation itself? All right, doesn't seem that there are any questions. Now, uh, I should note that the attendees here today will get a copy of my book on this topic. So if you are here and present, you'll vote in a poll at the end to get copies of my book. If you're watching this as a recording after the presentation, there you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash TAE event and fill out the form to get a copy of my book on this topic called as Camille mentioned, it's called Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. So again, if you're not here live present, and if you're watching this afterward, go to tinyurl.com forward slash TAE event to get a copy of the book. Without further ado, let's think about that lunch time. So you'll have lunch break in a couple of hours, so in several hours, and then you'll go to the fridge, whether it's in your work office or in your home office. And let's say you open it up and you see that you have the option of two ice creams there. So two ice creams. One contains 10% fat, another one is 90% fat free. And so think about these two ice creams, 10% fat or 90% fat free. Which of these sounds more appealing to you? Which of these would you like to eat? So please go ahead and vote. Would you prefer an ice cream that's 90% fat-free or 10% fat? So 90% fat-free or 10% fat? Please go ahead and vote. All 
All right, see most people voted, five more seconds. So we see that we have 65% of us would prefer 90% fat-free and 10% of us would prefer 10% fat. I'm sorry, 35% uh, of us would prefer 10% fat. So two thirds would prefer 90% fat-free and only one third would prefer 10% fat. But if we think about this, 90% fat-free means 10% fat, right? That's the definition. And 10% fat means 90% fat-free. These are the same things. And you are mathematically inclined folks. You understand this, you're auditing GRC, IT. You're not like, if I'm presenting this to marketers, it might be more difficult for them, but you understand this pretty well. But it's still clearly more desirable to have 90% fat free than 10% fat. Why is this? Well, because of the framing. And the framing is the difficulty here. So. I'm responding to a message that someone asked me. So the framing is the difficulty here, and this is called the framing effect, where how we see and interpret the world is determined by our frames. So it's determined by the frames, by what we see, by how we see things. And I want to ask you, how might various framings of hybrid work and remote work influence your perspective? How might the way that you perceive hybrid work and remote work influence whether it's 90% fat free or 10% fat? How might the way that leaders frame remote work and hybrid work impact the way that they perceive the situation? So this is often a tension, of course, between the leadership and the rank and file staff where leaders want employees in the office more often because they perceive hybrid work and remote work as a problem and they want to address it by having people in the office more often. But people who are in the rank and file, especially in IT, but also in GRC and auditing have more of a tendency to prefer more time worked remotely. So that's the framing effect. Now, I want you to check out this video so you'll be able to see a video. And your goal here will be to count the number of times the ball is passed, uh, people in white pass the ball. So we'll describe your goal here. So please take a look at the video, pay attention to the passing of the ball by people wearing white. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Now, this is another tendency somewhat similar to the framing effect called the attentional bias. When we're paying attention to something like counting the number of times someone passes the ball, 
we tend to miss other unexpected events. Sometimes we miss huge events like the gorilla, but sometimes we do see those when they're huge, kind of a major disruptor of some sort, but we miss other subtle things. So for example, people disengaging and eventually leaving the company, leaving the team, like the great resignation where many leaders miss this out, where many leaders who are forcing employees back to the office are missing the fact that many people are resigning. In fact, there was a survey that came out just about a week ago, which found that of all the companies that had back to office mandates, 46% were surprised by above expected attrition rates. So they expected some attrition by forcing people to go back to the office, this return to office mandate, but they were surprised by how bad it was. And I'm not taking a explicit position on whether return to the office is good or bad or not. We can talk about that later. We can use that in the Q&A, but I'm just giving you the facts on the, those companies were surprised by the loss or the context, the curtain changing color, how the context shifts. So how the context of people shifted where people care more about health and well-being as a result of the pandemic, and there's a stronger desire for flexibility, whereas many employers, leaders are trying to drive people to the office, having expectations that are in line with the pre-pandemic times and not in line with the current reality. Now, I'm curious, if you go to the chat function, how many of you saw, or how many of you got the answer right of 16 passes? So just chat whether you got whether you counted 16 passes correctly or not. So please go ahead and chat. Okay, so uh, we got one person so far who got 16 passes. Okay, how many people saw the book Gorilla? So, so we see that two people didn't so far, something like six did. Okay, three people didn't, so eight, nine did. Okay, so we saw maybe a, a quarter of you missed the gorilla. Okay, and I know usually about half the missed the gorilla, but I find in these sorts of presentations that people in IT, GRC, and auditing tend to be more detail-oriented and tend to see the gorilla more often. What about the player leaving the game? How many people saw the player leaving the game? Okay, so one person so far out of eight. Yeah, two people out of 10. Right, Jose, you know, Jose says wasn't focused on that. Yep, that, that's the point. <laughs> okay, and so we see that two people are out of 10, 11 people will solve. So something like under 20%. And what about the curtain? How many people saw the curtain change in color? Okay, one did. Okay. So three people did. Okay, so three people so, so again, something like 20% or so. Okay, so that should tell you something that these are dynamics that are, oh, okay, Jen said felt the background change, but didn't realize it was the curtain color. Okay, so you said something changed. So again, lower percentages than saw the gorilla. So this is, should tell you something. The gorilla is quite, quite a bit more obvious, right? Big, scary object, so to speak and we tend to miss the more of the background events. And again, this, you saw the player and the grill and the curtain changing color at a higher rate than let's say when I give this talk for executives. When I, when I give this talk for executives, I do see many of them seeing the gorilla, maybe about half, maybe about two thirds, but it's very rare that they see the curtain change color or the player leaving the game, I think because they tend to focus on the bigger picture and they're not detail oriented enough to focus these quite important nuances of you know, people disengaging and the context changing. 
So with these leaders, what often I see when I help, like I said, I help 24 companies transition to figuring out their hybrid work and remote work, and they tend to see hybrid work, remote work, so the time that people spend working remotely as a disruption, as a loss. They just see it as a problem, as a loss, as something to be addressed. They see it as a serious issue. Instead, it's much, much more effective, and I teach them to see it as a disruption. A disruption is an opportunity. It has challenges and problems, but it also offers opportunities. So a much healthier way to think about it, a framing, so the framing effect, and where do you want to pay your attention to, is the opportunity part of the disruption. It offers an opportunity to maximize productivity and engagement. If you put aside, if you put aside some default assumptions, habits, and preferences, and focus on business objectives and outcomes, even if doing so makes us personally uncomfortable. We need to do so. To do so, we need to overcome decision-making cognitive biases on the future of work, which we'll talk about later, and integrate best practices on innovative work arrangements. So these are going to be the keys to addressing the problems that we outlined with these decisions, with this inability to see important parts of the context and what we're paying attention to and what we're not paying attention to and how we frame the situation. Now, I'll check out this poll before we proceed. Was there ever a time when you made a bad decision and looking back, you realize you had the information you needed to make a better decision? Is that something that ever happened to you? About half of us answered. Let's give the other half five more seconds. So Tom, just uh, thank you for the chatting. Just answer in the poll, just click on the poll so you can get the percentage in. Okay, so overwhelmingly it happened to all of us. So this is pretty clear. That this is something that happens widely. And if we were perfectly rational decision makers, it shouldn't. If we have the information to make the good right decision, then we should make the right decision. The reason for us not making the right decision, even though we had the information to make the right decision, is a combination of this information twisting dynamics, whether it's the attentional bias, whether it's the framing effect, or other mistakes, other cognitive biases, these decision-making errors that cause us to make poor decisions. So let's talk about the data that will help us make better decisions on hybrid work and remote work. There are eight major dependent surveys I want to share about from organizations like the Harvard Business School, like the Society for Human Resource Management, which don't have a particular stake in any outcome, whether you come to the office or not coming to the office. And they show that overwhelmingly, 75 to 85% of workers who are remote capable don't want traditional office-centric work. For example, there was a McKinsey survey that showed that when offered the opportunity to do work remotely, 87% of workers would take that opportunity. 25 to 35% want full-time remote work. Full-time remote work. So that's a pretty high amount who want full-time remote work. But we see the dynamics. So 75 to 85% of workers don't want traditional office-centric work. So 15 to 25% want to work full-time in the office. 25 to 35% want to work full-time remotely. And the rest, of course, want so something like 50 to 60% want to work on a hybrid modality, coming into the office occasionally, sometimes. And that's an average. So when with IT folks, GRC auditing, I tend to see a higher rate of desire for more flexibility. So less desire for full-time in office work, more desire for remote work, and shifted to spending maybe one day in the office or maybe no days in the office. 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full time. We very clearly see that. I told you about the survey that just came out a week ago that where 46% of companies were surprised by the extent of attrition due to their return to office mandate. They expected some attrition, but it was higher than they expected. 
and over 70% were less likely to leave if offered substantially remote work. Now, we clearly see that remote work is great for retention and, of course, therefore recruitment. So recruitment, retention, very good for remote work. And obviously, for recruitment, you can get people, if you're doing fully remote work, you can get them around the globe. If you're offering at least flexibility, let's say one day a week, you can get people who are going to be outside the immediate commuting area, who are willing to drive for maybe two hours away if it's just for one day a week or something like that. So you'll get definitely better access. And there are going to be a bunch of people who are not going to be willing to come in for a full day work week. We'll also see that the remote employees are clearly more productive. On average, they work over 20 hours more per month. Why is that? Oh, it's overwhelmingly because they don't, they're not doing the commute. On average, the commute takes an hour or more and more in busy, in larger metropolitan areas. But West Florida, it's probably more like about an hour to commute back and forth. And then all the transition associated with it, putting on clothes, taking them off, setting up your computer in, in the workplace and so on. And so people are willing to work around 40% of the time that they're not commuting, they're willing to put into doing work. So that helps explain why you're working 20 hours more per month. Also, people have higher energy levels at different parts of the day. So some people are morning owls, some morning doves, some people are night owls. So some people prefer to start work at 5 a.m. and finish working at 3 p.m. Some prefer to start working at 11 a.m. and finish at 8 p.m. And that's their preference. And they do their work better in those sorts of time slots. That's great. With flexible timing, they can do that. A randomized controlled trial in a large company I want to share about this. This is a, a company called Trip.com. Trip.com is a large travel agency, as you can guess from the name. And it did a randomized control trial. It put half of its staff, including programmers, marketers, designers, HR, accounting folks, all of these customer call service personnel into full-time and office work, and the other into a hybrid modality, so coming in to the office occasionally and staying at home occasionally. And it found that after six months, the people who are working at least part of their time remotely had 35% better retention. That's 35% better retention. That's a huge improvement in retention, incredibly high improvement in retention. And they were more productive. So the it was it's a little bit hard to measure the productivity of HR people, accounting people, marketing people, their managers said they were more productive. They evaluated them as more productive, the people who are working at least part of their time remotely. But there's a hard metric, and people in IT will know this, writing code. So hybrid software engineers compared to the same engineers who were working in the office, so people who are facing the same incentives. It's not like they were incentivized to write garbage code. They all had the same incentives. They just end up writing more code because they spent more time working and they were more effective while doing so. Another benefit of working at home is that you're not distracted by others and you're more able to do your head down work. Now we'll talk more later about activities that are better done in the office and there definitely are some, but for things like programming, other individual work, it's much better to do that at home when you're not distracted by others for the large majority of people who have a normal, comfortable home office setup. Then let's talk about how that productivity changed. So there was a Stanford University study which found that in May 2020, workers were, who were working remotely were 5% more productive than their in-office colleagues doing the same tasks. So people were 5% more productive on average. And that's uh, immediately after the shutdown, so a couple of months. By May 2022, that productivity has increased. So people were 9% more efficient compared to May 2020, where they were 5% more efficient. What explains this difference? Why were people more productive over that period of time? Well, be because during the course of the pandemic, we learned how to work remotely better. We learned how to manage teams. We learned how to collaborate together better. Companies invested into various enterprise software, collaboration software. Utilities invested in, and governments invested into face faster than internet. Office workers who were working in their home office invested into better home offices. 
with uh, companies that I worked on consult that I consult for definitely gave their staff some money for better home offices. That's part of the things I encourage companies to do. So people were more productive over time and with probably the productivity improvement by now is even higher in May 2023 or June, it's already June 2023, happy June. Now, we know that working from home improves people's well-being. We see that extensively. So most of, mostly or fully remote work, over half the work, we could make 75%, over 75% happier, over 70% feel less stressed, and over 75% better able to manage work-life balance. So you tend to hear about people who are working remotely being socially isolated. And that can be a challenge for people who don't have other people, others in, in their home, especially more junior people, people who are extroverted. But we also see that people who are working remotely during the period of time that they're working remotely, they form better relationships with their family members and friends. So there was a survey by Cisco, which found that 74% had better relationships with family members, 51% had better relationships with friends as a result of doing at least some of their work remotely. So they have worse connections with their colleagues, but better connections with their family and friends. And that social isolation tends to balance out with the terms of the loneliness dynamic for people who do have those, have others at home. For people who don't have people, who don't have family members at home and who are not part of a friend network in their community, and also people who are in, extroverted, so both of those dynamics who are alone at home, who are extroverted, those would be tend to people who would be socially isolated. On the other hand, people don't have to go to the office, do the commute, the morning commute or the evening commute, which is the most stressful part of people's days. It's the most challenging part for the large majority of our days, times. So it's understandable why people are happier, less stressed and better able to manage work-life balance, especially for people who are doing childcare, elder care and so on. But remote work does have some challenges. So over 50% feel overworked when companies don't set good boundaries. Over 55% experience burnout, more for young adults. Again, when companies don't have good boundaries, and we'll talk about how to address that. Over 80% want fewer meetings. Definitely good to have not too many meetings. The biggest issues tend to be poor virtual communication skills and technology issues. So those are fixable issues. If companies invest into technology and invest into training their staff on effective virtual communication. All right. Now, I'm curious for you, which of these do you think are your preferred working styles? Do you prefer to work fully remotely? Do you prefer one day in the office, the rest at home, two days in the office, three days in the office, four days in the office, or full time, five days in the office? Please go ahead. So most of us work five more seconds. Okay, so you see that we have two thirds of you would prefer fully remote, then 20% would prefer some mixture of hybrid, and then 13% would prefer full-time in the office. So this is pretty typical for Osaka chapters that I present to. There's a more of a shift, as I mentioned before, if 25 to 35% of the average remote capable employee preferred working in preferred full-time remote work. So people, whether it's people in finance, professional services, whatever, in IT, auditing, GRC, especially in IT, there's more of a preference for fully remote work and more of a shift away from full-time in the office. So whereas full-time in the office, the average poll for remote capable people shows it's 15 to 25%, here it's 13%. B means, uh, so Jim asks, B means one day is in the office. Yeah, one day a week in the office. That's right, Jim. It means one day in the office. Okay, 
Thank you for clarifying, Ezekiel. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so now we're going to go to our first breakout group. So what I'll want you to do before, once we get into the breakout group, again, I'll give you the instructions. In the breakout room, you'll choose one person to be the reporter, and then you will have a discussion on the topic that I will assign in just a bit. You'll have a discussion, and then the reporter will report out to the broader group once we get back together, on the discussion, how it went, what the findings were, what the insights were. So I want you to discuss what the data that we just went through implies for your thought on hybrid work, on remote work. How does it change, how does it impact your perspective on hybrid work, on remote work, if at all? So again, the data we went through was on retention and recruitment was on productivity, was on well-being, and on remote work challenges. So thinking about all of this data that we went through, to what extent, if in any way, does it impact your thought on hybrid work and remote work? And how do you think it will impact the thought of other people on your team, on your, in your company, when you take this information back to them? Of course, hopefully you will be able to take this back to them and share it with them, right? Part of the point of doing this presentation. So how does it impact your own thinking? And how do you think it will impact the thinking of your colleagues? And I'll send you a link to the presentation so you, you'll have all this data. You can, of course, take notes on it now, but you will have a link to all the data from the presentation. Okay, so do you have any questions on what you'll be discussing? Doesn't seem like any questions. Good. So what I'll do is I'll click in just a few seconds on open all the rooms. You will see a button to join the room. And then you will please, once you join the room, turn on your microphone and camera to have a discussion. Then at the end, you will have a countdown timer to close the rooms. You don't need to leave the room immediately when you see the timer. Don't change anything. That's just a timer to let you know to finish up the discussion and that you will all be automatically brought back to the main room at that time. All right, I'm going to open all the rooms right now. If anyone has any technical issues, let me know. Ezekiel, Katina, Troy. Well, presume you don't have any technical issues and you're just preoccupied with something else.
All right, everyone. I think everyone's back. So, whoever is the reporter, are the reporters, please share what were the insights from your discussions. Hi, this is Michelle. I was from group one. Mm -hmm. And yes, um, Michelle. we discussed the majority of us are working, well, well a few of us are working full time remote, um, a couple uh, hybrid. Basically, this information hasn't changed any of our thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we enjoy the no commute, um, the flexibility. Um, you know, um, one person did miss some interaction with people mm -hmm. having that uh, interaction. And again, uh, someone else in our group, uh, it's really about leadership having concerns mm -hmm. of uh, culture concerns of being remote. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but they're enjoying the flexibility. So it'll be interesting at, at, at her organization if they make any changes. But mm -hmm. again, I think none of this information really changed anybody's thoughts on on the, the remote work environment. And again, mm -hmm. most everybody is um, happy with their ability to be remote or hybrid. Excellent. Not necessarily meant to change, just meant to inform. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Appreciate that, Michelle. All right. Whoever's next? All right. Late. Yep, this is Elliot uh, from group two. Um, so regarding the first question, did the data change our thought? Um, in our group, it didn't really um, change the way we thought about remote hybrid work. Uh, we were kind of in line with what the data uh, showed um, and felt similarly. Our team had a good mixture of people with lots of years of remote work experience. Mm -hmm. So we've, you know, even before COVID um, been dealing with teams globally and, and mm -hmm. remote. Um, so we weren't surprised by the data. Um, how will it impact the company team or our colleagues if we were to take this data back? Um, we didn't really think it would change the company or, mm -hmm. you know, ship's thought or approach on anything. Um, this, especially with like the higher level executive leadership, um, they mm -hmm. seem to be set in the decisions they've made um, and mm -hmm. that they pursue. Um, so I wish this data could <laughs> sway them a little bit more to think more, uh, you know, whole big picture and out of the box about it, but um, I don't think it would impact anything. All right, Elliot. Well, thank you. I appreciate that sharing that. And last but not least, who was the reporter for the last group? Tom? Yeah, I'll go ahead and report this, Tom. So from group three, um, we basically, uh, the data supports our beliefs, basically. Mm -hmm. and, um, some of the things that we talked about related to like challenges of being at home and your home environment uh, was also something. So if you have small children, mm -hmm. that yeah. sort of thing is, is something to consider. So you have to have the boundaries. Um, one of our team members said they had felt like they were a better family member uh, mm -hmm. as a result yeah. of being at home. Um, several of us changed jobs during COVID. So the mm -hmm. part of that, a great uh, resignation, if you will. Yeah, uh, commuting was a big problem. You know, we were talking about here in the Tampa area. Um, there's things like bridge fatigue because if you have to <laughs> cross a bridge, uh, you worry about that. That can really put like uh, easily put an hour or more on your commute. Um, yep. And the, the commutes uh, that we heard from some of our team members were like over an hour. So. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Thank so you. The, the, information really supported our our beliefs mm -hmm. I thought too much about the better friend and family um mm -hmm. yeah like I one thing I play trivia like every Wednesday and I yeah. wouldn't be able to do that um that's good and I'm a friend at home to get to trivia so anyhow yeah I think that does it help me with better friendship relationships mm -hmm. excellent okay good now, are there any questions about the data that we can that I can address? So, any questions about the data or about the framing effect or the attentional bias that we discussed earlier? I think there was uh, we had one more group group four. Oh, group four. I'm sorry, I missed the group four. Yes, go ahead, group four. Yes, so, Anthony. Uh, we had a good mix of uh, two individuals working more than four days in the office. One was full-time because mm. of their position. Um, mm. and, and they work full-time throughout the pandemic. So, mm. you know, everything has, has shifted 
because of the pandemic. But sure. um, you know, it it kind of depends. The viewpoint was was differing um, depending on the type of work. Um, <laughs> you know, in my uh, from from my point of view, um, it did not make sense for us to come in and have you know Zoom meetings <laughs> yeah. with other individuals in the office. So it made sense for us to to work remotely. Um, but some some were surprised by the data, um, mm. you know, with productivity and mm -hmm. how is that measured, especially for developers. How would you measure, you know? a developer be more productive in the office is there some type of time reporting feature that that they're mm -hmm. they're you know going into you know so maybe a little bit more detail about how that sure. data was measured check. and um just uh <laughs> so the individuals that were or oh, oh, that are working greater than four days per week they would like to get more information to try to convince mm -hmm. leadership like how you know how can we you know make that shift Let me get you um, that information for that. Okay. So I will get you the information on productivity from that company. But the company with the 8% higher productivity in terms of developer programming is just looking at outcomes, looking at the lines of code written in this with the same incentive system for people who are working in the office versus people who are working on the same payment system versus people who are working in a hybrid modality. So we clearly see that people are more productive when they are working in at home versus working in the office. A similar sort of data is found in other studies. People are more productive when they're working remotely. It's pretty clear. So I'll get you a couple of links that I'll put in the chat during the break. But yes, there's, it's pretty clear that the outcomes of people, both the amount of time they spend working and the kind of outcomes that they're getting in terms of the lines of code written, other sort of metrics that are compared with people who are in the same position, but working in the office. Again, same system, same incentives, same reward structure, same control structure. The people who are working remotely are clearly just working more time and they're having more output in accordance with working more time. Other questions? Okay, I see that there are no questions. It's 9.28 now. So let's take a 10 minute break and be back at 9.38. I'll see you then.
We'll start in about 30 seconds to give everyone time to get back. So 30 seconds. All right, I think everyone hopefully is back now. So let's talk about some of the mistakes that people, especially leaders, tend to make around hybrid work and remote work. And these are called cognitive biases. Hopefully you've heard about cognitive biases by now. It's a pretty common terminology. Now, cognitive biases are the decision-making errors we make because of how our minds are wired. So our minds are unfortunately not wired for the modern environment. They're wired for the ancient savanna. We haven't evolved for the modern environment. We're interacting right now as small squares in the Zoom screen. That's not something we're wired for. We are wired, our minds are structured for the ancient savanna. When we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people, we had to be very tribal. We had to have a very strong fight or flight reflex. You might've heard of it as the saber-toothed tiger reflex, where it was more important for us to jump at a hundred shadows than to miss that one saber tooth tiger. And one of the important dynamics that's in the environment was the unchanging nature of the environment, the status quo. The only thing that changed the broader context was the seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter, and then they cycled all around. So anything that was a change in the context was pretty dangerous because life was very precarious back in the savannah. And so most likely we have this desire to maintain or get back to the status quo coming from that precarious survival impulse where it was important to maintain and do what we previously did. Otherwise, it would be pretty dangerous for us in that savanna environment. Now, in the modern environment, of course, we have many more disruptions like the disruption of the pandemic, like the disruption of remote work, like the disruption of artificial intelligence, the rise of the smartphone, the fiscal crisis of 2008, 2009, that calls for changing, you know, responding to disruption by taking advantage of it, instead of just simply treating it as a problem and a loss and trying to get back to the status quo we know. But many leaders who grew up and became mature leaders before the pandemic, they're very comfortable with management by walking around, with leadership by in the office, and they're not comfortable at all with leading people who are working remotely or working in a hybrid modality. So that causes a lot of problems, especially for leaders, because of the discomfort and lack of knowledge with how to read, lead effectively and manage teams effectively in a hybrid and remote environment, many of them desire to get back to the office and they have the status quo bias. So that's one problem the status quo bias. Another problem I want to share with you about is the confirmation bias. If you've heard of any cognitive biases, you've probably heard of this one, the confirmation bias, where our minds tend to look for information that confirms our pre-existing beliefs. Now, if you think back to that savanna, saber-toothed tiger environment, so that saber-toothed tiger instinct, where it's more important to jump at 100 shadows than to get away from that saber-toothed tiger, we are predisposed to make quick decisions based on limited information and our pre-existing beliefs. So we look for that information and we jump to conclusions very quickly. We confirm our biases. Like our pre-existing beliefs that office-centric works best is one of these examples. We are not predisposed if we have bias that we really need to come to the office to look for the information that I talked about in the previous section which would show that actually flexibility has a lot of benefits that are very good for the business's bottom line. And finally, functional fixedness. It's kind of like the hammer nail syndrome. So when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When you perceive, when you learn one way of functioning, when you learn one way of leading, when you learn one way of collaborating, 
with managing teams, you tend to apply that modality to everything else. So that's where you see leaders trying to shoehorn an office culture into hybrid work and remote work. And then they're wondering, well, it doesn't work very well, therefore we need to get everyone back to the office. But what's actually happening is a failure to adapt strategically to the need to work differently in hybrid teams and remote teams, to the need to lead differently, to collaborate differently, to manage teams differently. So this is a serious problem that I see, especially in leaders. Now, I'm curious which of these you've seen as being one the most problematic for the future of work in your workplace. It's the status quo bias, the confirmation bias, or functional fixedness. Please go ahead and vote. About five more seconds, make your voice heard. Hmm. Camille says that there's no pop up to vote. Well, I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, the, most people had the pop up, so we, you can, should be able to see it that uh, about just under a quarter, just under a half voted that the status quo bias was the biggest problem, followed by just under a third of functional fixedness and a quarter of confirmation bias. So really reasonably even distribution of the status quo bias winning out. So that's good to know. And that's good for you to be thinking about it. Now, we'll get into breakout rooms again. So again, choose the person who will report out at the start of it, and then we will have the breakout rooms open. I will recreate the breakout rooms so that you have different people. And what I want you to be thinking about is how each of these biases might be impacting the decisions around the future of work in your workplace. So again, how might each of these cognitive biases be impacting the decision-making around the future of work in your workplace? So please go ahead and think about that topic. So each of these biases might be impacting the decision-making on future work in your workplace. Questions about the prompt. Okay. There you go. You should be able to join the rooms now.
Hello, everyone. I think most people are back now. Good. OK. So let's do the reporting out. What was what's the conclusion that you came to? So whoever wants to share first, Troy. Yeah, sure. So I know for our team, we, we talked about all three different phases and there were a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, status quo, of course, is status quo. You know, you're, you're seeing and you're happy and you're, you're, you're where you are and this, everything's cool. And the second one was uh, confirmation. And in, in that, in that sense, we felt it was a sense of finding things in, a, in that culture and environment that you're in that, mm -hmm. that gives you an affirmation of what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, and, and it's always yeah. looking for that one. And then the last one, we we love the analogy with the hammer and, and chasing the nail. We kind of went back and forth a little bit on that one that mm -hmm. even though, you know, they're all the same, but you have the hammer, but you see everything as a nail. And, yeah. and, and I kind of brought up the thing, the fact of, even though you see it as a nail, it definitely isn't a nail and you're searching yeah. for, you know, you're, you're actually searching for the perfection kind of thing. So mm -hmm. you, you saw a lot of similarities. Excellent. Well, thank you, Troy. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. These are all linked in terms of the information biases have caused us to think problematically and make bad decisions around hybrid work, remote work, and other areas. Great. Thank you. Right. Other folks? The consensus groups. from our group was yes, that uh, confirmation bias was the strongest one, mm -hmm. that leadership sought out facts that confirmed that a uh, in the office is the best and mm -hmm. no other approach should be taken and only under great reluctance would they, you know, grant remote work or if there were incidents surrounding remote work that they'd basically yank it away because one person mm -hmm. screwed it up for everyone. Yeah. So yeah. That, that was the consensus from our group. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Good illustration, Jeff. Appreciate it. Okay. Ben. Yes, from our group, we had a nice conversation about the different biases and how there's a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. And we, we see that one bias easily leads into additional yeah. biases. Sure. Um, but then our conversation kind of migrated a little bit to the fact that uh, the companies have also other biases uh, that are based mm -hmm. more on uh, bottom line and mm -hmm. um, physical assets. So say these companies mm -hmm. just built a big campus it's got 30,000 yeah. square feet and now only 100 people show up into that property every day mm -hmm. that is a huge waste of company assets yeah. that they have Sucking to costs. be able to explain yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. so yep. there's biases there too with mm -hmm. the um with explaining to shareholders or to corporate infrastructure why did we invest in all of this if we're going to send everybody to work from home mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely a problem I've seen in a number of companies that own their own offices or have a long-term lease. Thank you, Ben. Okay, last but not least. So we had a, a consensus on the functional fixedness, mm -hmm. um, you know, type that old school management. Um, and we saw an issue going forward strategically. Mm -hmm. There is going to be an issue attracting, you know, talent. There's yeah. going to be an issue attracting the younger generation because this is what they wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, and someone in our group made the point, she's like, I, I'm, I'm sick today, but, you know, I'm remote, so it, yeah. it works. Um, and um, I, I was thinking, um, you know, we have a, a mix of clinicians that have to go in and mm -hmm. administrative staff that can work remotely. Um, yeah. I was thinking, you know, all tech people should be remote. And then somebody brought up the point, there's a huge tech company here in, in the Tampa Bay area. Now they're auditing their employees' badges to see who's actually coming into work. Oh. So it's, it's you know, that that perception that one way is the right way is, is going to be difficult for them. When they see mm -hmm. their attrition, um, you know, they look at those numbers. Because, you know, we're seeing now in, in IT from analysts to C-suites are, are leaving. So, yep. you know, it's a high stress job, you know, and even though they're remote, it they're still looking for more of a work-life balance. So it's, sure. it's that that changing of the mindset is, is going to take some time and it's going to be in the metrics going forward. Yeah. And as I mentioned, we have a survey that companies are surprised by the attrition that they're getting from mandated return to work. Okay, good. Any questions about these cognitive biases before we move forward?
Okay. Sounds like no. Great. So let's go on to a challenge, the challenges associated with a mandated return to office, what I call the four horsemen of the mandated return to office. And this is a phrase that my client used when I was helping them figure out their transition. So she's kind of, she has a religious perspective and she used that phrase that she was like, oh, these, we're having these few, four big challenges that are like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So I asked her if I could steal it and she said, sure, steal it and share it with others. So here are the four big challenges. One is resistance, another is attrition, third is quiet quitting, and fourth is loss of diversity and inclusion. These are the four biggest issues I see with companies mandate a return to office. And I've helped some companies mitigate these issues when they mandated return to office, but they still are going to be present, definitely, as an issue. So let's talk about these four issues. First, horsemen, resistance. Let's talk about some cautionary tales. One is General Motors. You might have heard of it that oh, on a Friday, a few months ago, they announced that they're going back to the office three days a week. And they got that the CEO announced it, and she got a lot of flack, a lot of pushback, and there was over the weekend. And by Tuesday, the CEO rolled back the plan, said that no, it was a mistake, we screwed up, and that they will not have that three days back to the office for everyone. And the credibility of the return to office plan was seriously undermined as a result, of course. So this is an example of how resistance can really undermine credibility. Apple is another cautionary tale. Apple maintained it three days a week. And Apple employees, of course, as I'm sure you know, are known to be compliant, are known to be loyal, but they faced serious backlash. Over a thousand employees signed a petition requesting flexibility. And just today, there was the walkout by Amazon employees demanding more flexibility after Amazon forced its staff to go back to the office three days so this is an other example. Amazon staff are not known for being rebellious, but this is something that they did. They had this walkout. So resistance is clearly makes big news at large companies, but at mid-size and small ones, I see resistance all the time that in the form of employee backlash. And that's more public or public within the company. But there's also resistance by non-compliance. So firms that mandate a return to office often see higher rates of non-compliance. I've seen up to 50% of employees at some firms not comply with some aspect of the return to office. Some just don't show up, they dare their employer to fire them. Some come in a day or two when three days are required. And some come in for an hour or two each day for the three days that are required. So just for the meetings that they have to be in person for, and then they go back home, even though the expectation, the requirement is for them to stay the whole day. So that's another form of non-compliance. And many managers, which is really interesting, refuse to discipline employees for non-compliance. Some tell me that they feel like being non-compliant themselves. So I was talking to the CHRO of a major Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturing company, which lost she lost the battle in the C-suite for forcing employees to back to the office. And she was telling me how she was really felt like being non-compliant herself with these mandates from the top. How do companies respond to non-compliance? So there was a Gartner survey that showed that only 3% of companies actually fire non-compliant employees. 30% have HR talk to them. There was a Stanford University survey that showed that 42% of bosses simply ignore defined resistant employees. 14% issue verbal reprimands say you did a bad thing. 10% give negative performance reviews, 15% reduce pay, 12% threaten termination. But there's a difference between threatening termination and uh, actually terminating, and that's the 3% of companies that the Gartner survey measured. My compliance with my clients. So what do my clients do? Some just ignore non-compliance employees if those employees aren't in management roles. Some issue verbal reprimands, some reduce pay. None of them did things like issuing negative performance reviews or terminating employees because the employees didn't, I mean, for negative performance reviews, they still had high performance. Second horseman. So that's the first horseman, non-compliance. Second horseman is attrition. So that's the second 
big challenge that I see. Apple, GM, and others, many companies, we, we were just talking about this, Anthony was talking about this, are facing serious attrition problems as a result of a forced return to office mandate, including at the highest levels. Apple is an example. So Apple's head of AI, Ian Goodfellow, quit his position due to Apple not providing flexibility for his team. So he emailed his staff about his departure saying that, quote, I believe strongly that more flexibility would have been the best policy for my team, unquote. And that's the head of AI. You know how hot AI is right now. So this is a huge deal. And Anthony was mentioning that in other companies that are perhaps not quite as household names as Apple, but I'm sure well-known in Tampa, that they're even executives are leaving. What does the data say? So I mentioned this study by Trip.com, which randomly assigned employees to have the traditional schedule, the other half to significant flexibility. And as I mentioned, those who had significant flexibility had 35% better retention. So I told you about their productivity, they had 8% better productivity for programmers, but everyone had 35% better retention. So after the trial, they changed all staff to have significant flexibility, not surprising. How many days works best is a question I often hear clients ask. There was a spring study in 2002 by Harvard Business School at a large company in Bangladesh, which randomly assigned staff to different schedules. Some came in less than one day, fully remote, you know, maybe once a month or so. Some came in one to two days in the office, mostly one day. Some came three to five days in the office, closer to three days. Group B performed best of this group, so the one that came one day to the office. They had the best work output, the greatest satisfaction, and the strongest social connections. And it's kind of surprising, the strongest social connections, I'll, leaders often ask me, like, shouldn't the three days, three to five days in the office have the strongest social connections? Not really. Apparently, the people who came to the office one day a week, two days a week, they spent more of that time socializing and connecting with people. So they actually end up having the strongest social connections. Now, the SHRM survey, Society for Human Resources, found that 48% of survey respondents will definitely look for a full-time work-from-home job in the next search. To take a full-time job with a 30-minute commute, 30-minute there, 30-minute back, they need a 20% pay raise. To take a half-time job with a 30-minute commute, they need a 10% pay raise. So 20% pay raise for full-time, 10% for half-time. So you can pay people <laughs> to come to the office, but you're obviously going to lose out on payroll. Now, when you want to reduce attrition, my clients use several tools. The most essential tool is empathy. So really, you want to show that you understand people and their challenges. And unlike Elon Musk, who just decree that it's a job requirement to come in, you're immoral if you don't come in. Nobody likes to hear that. That's not accurate about immorality. We can talk about that. But simply demanding office presence is a great way to lose talented staff. I was talking to a CHRO yesterday of a large company, and she was describing how she, this was second had information, she was talking to another CHRO from another company who told me, who told her that, well, they're mandating that employees return to the office uh, partially as a way to force attrition to not have layoffs. And the CHRO I was talking to, who is much more oriented toward flexibility and understands the importance of it, was kind of shocked by that strategy because you are going to lose your most talented staff if you if that's the way you handle layoffs. If, you, if you're going to have layoffs, you need to lay off people who are least productive, right? That makes sense. But instead, you're laying off, you're losing people who have the most ability to find a job elsewhere. And you're keeping the people in the office who have the least ability to find a job elsewhere. That is not a great way to have layoffs. Empathy means understanding the perspective of employees. So you spent the pandemic working successfully, mostly from home. And so many see a requirement to come in several days a week as a heavy burden, an un unfunded mandate, which disrupts their lives, costs them money, and exposes them to COVID. So costs money and time, obviously. Average office workers costs, according to research by Owl Labs, financially, you have $432 a month from working from home, from utilities, office supplies, think food, things like this. Commuting to work, by contrast, is $863 a month. So over $400 more per month. That's over 5,000 per year when you 
total all the top 4,800 plus a little bit more. So about 5,000 per year. And that doesn't include relocation expenses of someone who would away further from the office. Time is another big issue. The average daily commute is over an hour. Sometimes, as we mentioned, over an hour and a half or two hours for people in the Tampa area, much more in larger urban areas like Tampa. And so this is really important to keep in mind and to empathize with people around us. Don't ignore the elephant in the room. Acknowledge the pain points of staff, I tell my clients. Show that you recognize the cost of time and money and share the stuff of your own challenges, how returning to office disrupts your own life. So the say HR who felt like being non-compliant herself in the Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturer. I talked to her and we figured out a strategy where she can share her own story of how it was a challenge for her. And she had struggles with coming back to the office as well. And that helped address some of the challenges that the staff, the employees of the company had with coming to the office. You ought to also want to offer payments. You want to pay for people's commuting, IRS mileage for driving, their parking costs, their public transit. Pay for the lunch costs. I mean, you, trust me, it will be much better than attrition from people not coming to the office. Their local restaurants or cater lunch, pay for their relocation for those who moved further away from campus and pay for childcare and elder care. Finally, salary increases is something you should consider for especially key staff. So these are ways of dealing with attrition. Addressing COVID fears. A good way of doing that is encouraging all staff to get the bivalent booster shots because not to force, not to mandate in any way, but for encouragement like time off to get the shots and sick leave to recover from side effects. You know, this is not controversial. Giving sick leave and time off to recover from these and it will encourage people who still have COVID fears, which there definitely are a number of people who have COVID fears. It will help them feel better about coming to the office. Okay, third horse, quite quick. Employees psychologically disengage from their work. That's the term for quite quick. Do just get enough to get by without getting in trouble. That's quite quitting. That's the terminology. You've heard this around, I'm sure. That's the definition of the quite quitting. Quite quitting, I find uh, with my clients, it can be worse than resistance or attrition, which are much more obvious because quite quitting is hard to see. It can rot the company's culture from within. So it's quite dangerous and underestimated. The impact of the forced return to office, according to Gallup research, of forcing employees to come to the office leads to disengagement, fear, and distrust. Ben Wygest, who is the Gallup Director of Research and Strategy for Workplace Management, said that, in, quote, employees experience significantly lower engagement, significantly lower well-being, significantly higher intent to leave, and significantly higher levels of burnout. Whereas the optimal engagement boost occurs when employees spend 60 to 80% of their time, three to four days in a five-day work week, working off-site. So again, the same thing that the Harvard Business School study found, one to two days in the office closer to one day is the best strategy. A future forum report found that remote workers compared to fully in-office workers are more likely to feel connected to their direct manager, to their company's values, and equally likely to feel connected to their immediate teams. Workers with full schedule flexibility compared to those with rigid schedules are quite a bit more productive, 29% higher productivity, not surprising, 53% better ability to focus because they're spending time working remotely where they can be much more focused. And flexible remote work policies are cited as the number one factor in improving company culture over the past two years. So very strong dynamics. Cisco survey of 28,000 global employees showed that 78% showed that remote work improved overall well-being, just going back to the stuff that we discussed in the context of quiet quitting. 79% say that remote work improved work-life balance. 51% say that remote work strengthened their friendships. And 74 say that it improved their family relationships. So this is the underlying data for what I was mentioning before, that the social isolation is kind of a myth that people who are, all people who are working remotely are socially isolated. People who are don't have anyone at home and don't have a strong friendship network and who are extroverted, young people, generally in that category, they tend to be socially isolated. That's a problem for them. But for people who have family at home, who have a good friendship network and people who are introverted, they don't mostly don't have that social isolation as a problem. Of course, people who are introverted and friendship network and family at home, some of them do feel socially isolated. Not saying it's no one, but generally on average, that's not a problem. 
they actually have better relationships with their family and friends than they had before they worked remotely. 82% say the ability to work from anywhere has made them happier. 55% say it decreased their stress levels. So forced return to the office clearly harms well-being, leads to burnout, and contributes to quiet quitting. So address quiet quitting. You want to use a number of tools. Address the single biggest source of frustration, which is coming into the office and doing the same thing you would do at home with a worse meeting experience because of hybrid meetings. So curate an in-office experience that avoids this problem. The only good reasons to come to the office other than accessing physical resources are collaboration, socializing, and training. So those are the good reasons to come to the office, to collaborate with others, whether it's with your team members or one-on-one -on -one to have more deep conversations, nuanced conversations, maybe about performance management, maybe a leader communicating strategy to her team. Those are the good things to be doing at the office. Socializing with your colleagues, socializing, connecting, forming team bonds, collegial bonds, definitely helpful. And training, especially for junior staff, very helpful to have on the job, to have onboarding, spending more time in the office, to have on the job training, to have some mentoring. Those are better things done in the office. So, so of course, you can do all of them remotely. But there's definitely a good reason to come to the office. These are high stakes, high value activities, but they generally don't take up more than 10, 20% of your time, and maybe even less if you're an IT worker. So this is fits very well within the kind of one day a week is quite fine for engagement, socializing, team building, collaboration of the previous studies. Facilitate socializing and collaboration. So I work with clients to do that. As part of an initial office return, it's important to create fun experiences for staff, escape from events, other forms of team bonding, and you want to train managers on leading hybrid teams so that time in the office is focused on collaboration. You don't need to come to the office to do your individual head down work, auditing reports, to compliance reporting. You don't need to do it to do programming, bug checking, quality control. You don't need to do it to work on emails and Microsoft Teams messages and Slack messages. You don't need to do it to do video conference calls. Much better done at home. You're in your own private, comfortable environment and you're not distracting others around you. So you want to focus on collaborative activities in the office. And time at home should be focused on preparing for these activities and on those individual tasks that we just discussed. Invest in training. Demonstrate investment into professional development, especially for those staff hired during the pandemic. It's very important to help them get them integrated, to get on-the-job training. That's very helpful. And definitely, time spent in the office is helpful for that. It's not necessary. It takes more effort and more intentionality and deliberate attention if you're going to do it remotely. Don't forget longer tenured staff. So prepare training events to meet the needs of both groups. Start with training on how to work in a hybrid setting, what to do at home, what to do in the office, how to collaborate effectively and communicate effectively, how to have hybrid meetings especially. This tends to be a big challenge when some people are in the room and some people are remote. We can talk about what, how to do that effectively. So you definitely want everyone to bring their laptops, who is in the room, open them up. You want people to, so that people who are remote can see you, you can see them, you're all squares on the screen. They can see when you're talking to other people in the room. They can see your lips moving, you looking off to the side. You can see their chat. You can see their emojis. You can engage with them effectively. You can look at the big screen. You can look at your own screen. That is very helpful. So definitely having hybrid meetings and training people on how to do so. Invest into office and technology improvement. So redesign offices to be much more collaborative spaces, since most work in the office will be more collaborative rather than individual. Staff will do their individual work at home. Update your technology for hybrid meetings. With traditional technology, they're an awful experience. So remote attendees are just second-class citizens. Or I see on-site staff dialing from their cubicles, which is not great. It kind of negates the point of coming to the site, right? OK, the fourth force is loss of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So according to the Future Forum report, 21% of white knowledge workers wanted to work from the office full time. What about black knowledge workers? So 21% of white knowledge workers, what about black knowledge workers? Only 3%. Only 3% wanted to work from the office full time. We have other studies showing similar metrics. 50% of all black office workers wanted to work from home permanently compared to only 39% of white workers. 
Why is that? Well, unfortunately, black professionals are still suffering from discrimination and microaggressions at the office. They're less vulnerable to harassment in remote work, although still vulnerable. So there's a preference to spend more time working remotely. And similar findings for some similar reasons and different ones apply to other underrepresented groups. For example, consider women. According to a conference board study, 78% of women say workplace flexibility is key to them, whereas only 61% of men say that. Why? Well, women, unfortunately, still have more of a child care and elder care burden in our society. The impact on people with disabilities is especially powerful. October 2022 study by the Economic Innovation Group, which used US Census data, found that the employment rate fell sharply early in the pandemic for everyone, all workers. By Q2 2022, people without disabilities rose to 1.1% below pandemic levels. So fell sharply, mostly recovered, didn't fully recover. It's 1.1% below pandemic levels by Q2 2022. What about people with disabilities? So compared to, and again, it fell sharply for people with disabilities, and it rose to above pre-pandemic levels, 3.5% above pre-pandemic levels. Why? Remote work, simple, clear. The data aligns with expert statements. So Thomas Foley, who is the executive director of the National Disability Institute, said that workers with disabilities were asking to work remotely for decades, and companies just said no, no, and no. During the pandemic, according to Thomas Foley, quote, we all realized that many of us could work remotely. That was disproportionately positive for people with disabilities, unquote. Very clear. Long COVID is another factor here because it exacerbates disability. 19% of those who had COVID developed long COVID, according to the CDC. And 25% of those with long COVID changed their employment status for working hours. So long COVID is anything that lasts more than a couple of months, symptoms that last more than a couple of months after you have COVID. Frequently it's anosmia, which is inability or weakened sense of smell, which is not really going to impact your employment unless you depend on your nose for your employment. But other symptoms would include fatigue and brain fog. So long COVID, 25% of those with long COVID changed their employment status or working hours. So it interfered with work for 4 million people, according to a study from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And the pandemic increased the number of people with disabilities, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So the number of disabled people in the US grew by 1.7 million since the pandemic started, mainly due to long COVID conditions such as fatigue and brain fog. So nosmia affects more people, but fatigue and brain fog is what actually caused disability. 800,000 dropped out of the labor force, but 900,000 newly disabled people did continue working in large part thanks to remote work. And long COVID has an impact on Americans with Disabilities Act. So the Federal Reserve Bank of New York notes that long COVID would be considered a disability under the ADA, depending on the nature of the condition. It's a legally reasonable accommodation for those struggling with issues like fatigue and brain fog. And we already see the impact on diversity and inclusion of companies that allow remote work. So Meta, as an example, offers full-time remote work. According to its chief diversity officer, candidates who accept the job offers for remote positions were substantially more likely to come from diverse communities. They came from less flexible companies as well. So Meta set in 2019, long before the pandemic, set a five-year diversity plan goal. As you know, these plans often don't reach their desired outcomes. But we Meta reached its plans, five-year plans, within three years, by 2022. It doubled its Hispanic and Black workers in the US. It doubled the number of women in its global workforce. And the people with disabilities increased from 4.7 to 6.2% of employees. So how do you address DI challenges? Improve ERG groups, employee resource groups. I've worked with a number of clients on doing so. Many organizations already have ERGs for women and people of color. You wanna support them better. Often organizations don't have sufficient ERG groups for people with disabilities. So you need to establish those, including those with long COVID. And often there are no ERG groups for parents. This is another one to establish because they face particular issues with the return to the office. Of course, offer ADA accommodations for fully remote work for those with disabilities, including fatigue and brain fog. In-person mentoring for underrepresented groups is another way to address 
the diversity and the inclusion challenges associated with the return to office. A lack of sponsorship and mentoring is a huge challenge for underrepresented groups. So you want to provide mentoring. It, two mentors, important to provide for each mentee. One from the majority group and one from the underrepresented group that shares the identity of the mentee, at least one of the identities, underrepresented identities, to give access to both kinds of networks and experiences. In-person mentoring meetings are especially helpful because they provide immediate value to the underrepresented mentee, helps them see the benefit of returning to the office, and in-person mentoring, of course, is better overall than remote mentoring, although, again, you could do remote mentoring, but it's easier to build up vulnerability and trust when you see the other person or when you see the other person face to face and can actually have a more thorough and deep conversation about a variety of issues, consider nuanced body language, address emotions, anxieties, and so on. Now, measuring success in returning to the office, how do you measure? Well, there are a number of traditional metrics like retention, especially for those from underrepresented groups, productivity, performance, and sick days. So those are traditional metrics and they tend to be easier to measure. Measuring success in the return to the office in more qualitative measures requires a survey, customized to return to the office, which you'll get as part of my book. It should include demographic data and establish a baseline before a return to office. Or if you already returned to office, you should establish a baseline now. So establish an intent to stay, happiness, engagement, well-being, and a sense of connection to the supervisor, to team members, to business unit members, and to company culture. So that's what the survey should follow. And then you want to repeat the survey at regular intervals, every three to six months after returning to the office, or if you already did after they initially doing the survey, evaluate different business units and I encourage you to have them run deliberate experiments on what works best for them. Evaluate the results and study the data based on your own internal experience. So I'm giving you information more broadly, but you wanna study on what's going on within your company. Use your data to change the return to the office as needed and reevaluate results. Okay, everyone. So at this point, I'd like you to get into breakout rooms again. So what we'll be discussing are these four horsemen of the return to office and the ways of measuring the success of the return to office. So how, what, which of the four horsemen do you think might be most problematic for your company? How have you seen each of the four horsemen impact your company if you had a return to office or impact other companies that had returned to office. So please talk about that. How did it impact your company or how did it impact other companies you've seen the four horsemen of the mandated return to office? Are there any questions about what we'll be doing? Okay, so if there are no questions, remember to start by choosing somebody who will be a reporter, and then you will proceed. So again, I'm opening up the rooms. Please go ahead.
All right, I think we should most of us mostly be back now. Um, yeah. Okay, good. So, whoever was a reporter, please unmute yourself and share for many of the groups. I'll start off, but I'm not sure which group I was in. <laughs> but That's anyway, fine. Um, we did discuss, uh, so, uh, you know, these these items. I, I think part mm -hmm. of our challenge was that a lot of these have to really be driven by senior leadership, and, mm -hmm. and that, in a sense, is going to be a challenge that they yeah. may or may not recognize this. I know within my own company, they have started uh, focus on a lot of these areas, uh, but mm -hmm. they're still going through that, you know, transition stage and still uh, trying to deal with the different challenges. Uh, I, we had one team member that mentioned that resistance is probably the biggest one that we see mm -hmm. happening in the environment. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, the goal is for you to take some of this information, bring it to your senior leadership, because it's not only the nature of the issue, but also how to solve it. And your senior leadership might appreciate some of the information on doing that. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Well, although I'm not sure how much my senior leadership will listen to me if I bring it back to them. <laughs> you can only try. I mean, you'll have the. You, you, yes. you should. You should have the. I mean, you'll get a book from me, but they won't read it. Uh, but you'll be able to have the video from the presentation where you can show them the important moments, and you'll have the presentation slides, which you can, you know, they, those they might look through. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Gina. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, I am from group number three. I would say from three. Uh, mm -hmm. We discussed each one of the enforcement, um, starting with uh, attrition. Um, yeah, uh, in uh, our different organizations, uh, a lot of people, we lost a lot of people uh, due to the mm -hmm. flexibility, no? Yeah. Working, not being able to work remotely. So um, that was a big, big point for, you know, yeah. The organizations why quitting uh it's it was it's a little bit difficult to 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 measure no mm -hmm. um, but um, sure. basically you know it was um a lot you could see that some of the employees that were originally very engaged and mm -hmm. for some reason there was a lack of interest at some point mm -hmm. uh, you know Probably because yeah. they were working elsewhere. <laughs> sure. yeah. um, regarding you know loss uh, of diversity and inclusion, uh, well, this is mm -hmm. something that we wouldn't have you know an advantage uh, on because um, um, it would be much easier for somebody from HR actually to be able to you know, to notice that I guess. But, yeah. And uh, resistance, mm -hmm. um, well. Um, Personally, and I don't think anybody else in the group, uh, you know, met somebody that, you know, was very upfront and say, hey, we're not going to do this, mm -hmm. so, you know, okay. sign a letter or something. So, yeah, but uh, we've seen, you know, some of them, like I said, basically attrition was the one that uh, okay. uh, affected most of them. Okay, attrition, yeah. Uh, so the previous one was resistance more and your group had more attrition. Good, yeah. good to know. Okay. Uh, next group, Kristen. Hello. Um, Hello. So we kind of had a combination of both resistance and attrition seemed to be uh -huh. the two that um, okay. came up the most. I know um, the experience at my company, we tend to be a, a company with great longevity for our employees, which is mm -hmm. probably a little rarer in this yeah. world um, where yeah. people do tend to hop around a little bit more. And mm -hmm. we've even seen an uptick of... Um, not just lower level employees, but even higher level employees that have mm. left the company for better opportunities for more remote work or yeah. um, different options like that. Um, mm. And as far as like monitoring, um, uh -huh. we do have um, like associate surveys that we do. But one okay. of the things um, we talked about that I hadn't really thought about is that we haven't really adjusted them to ask questions about remote work. So that mm. is something that. Um, I could bring back to the table to Go say, ahead. you know, and, and maybe they did it on purpose because they didn't want to know what people's feelings well, were. Um, be important we are, that. we are a hybrid right now. We, we mm -hmm. have three days in the office, two days mm -hmm. at home. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyway. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's definitely important to know. So hopefully they will. <laughs> okay. And the last group. So, um, 
in my experience, um, mm -hmm. you know, we transitioned from being in the office during the pandemic, we went fully remote and then towards the end of the pandemic came back. So there was a lot of resistance, obviously, mm -hmm. Led yeah. to quiet quitting, led to a lot of attrition. So it was, yeah. you know, the three top ones were there. Um, mm. Diversity was not not that big of an issue. I think, okay. you know, many of the companies that I have worked for, super diverse. I mean, I'm from the Caribbean okay. and, you know, work with people from Ukraine to people mm. from, you know, the Philippines. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was very diverse. So okay. um, I think, you know, the most dangerous one is obviously the quiet quitting because there's no way to yeah. really tell, there's no way to really measure it. Somebody works, they're, mm. they're nine to five and then, Exactly. Um, you know, they're in the middle of a project and then you get the, the notification I'm leaving. So uh, <laughs> it does affect it does affect the group. Um, sure. You know, when I left my prior job because we went back, you know, full time, mm -hmm. um, you know, I did give I said, you know, I, I need to give at least a, a two month notice to kind of transition out, you know, yeah. finish my project. And not everybody's going to be that way. But, sure. um, you know, coming back into the office, somebody said, you know, don't create the same environment in the office as you were remote. I mean, you know, mm. what, what different can you do? Um, and people will think, you know, let, let's, you know, be more progressive. Let's, you know, we, we can do more productivity remotely than we can do in the office, obviously. Um, yeah, of another course. thing now for the, the company that I work for, the mm. team is small, but we value working remotely as well mm -hmm. as make a note of having team building exercises. So whether nice. it's having lunch, whether it's going bowling, um, playing top golf, um, you know, do something nice. with that team. And we enjoy mm -hmm. working with one another and we enjoy those team building exercises where we can, you know, chat and, and catch up. Excellent. Okay, good. Thank you for sharing and I appreciate it. So this clearly you shared and your group had quite quitting as the biggest challenge. Good. Thank you. Are there any questions about any aspects of this mandated return to office? Okay, if not, so we've come for over an hour in this module. So let's take a 15 minute break. It's 10.50 now. Let's go back. Be back at 11.05, please.
Thank you all. Bye-bye. We'll start up in a minute. Okay, I hope everyone's back. Let's start up. So instead of a simple, forceful top-down mandate from returning to the office, we have, as we talked about earlier already, research shows that that will not get you the best business outcomes. So when you're talking to leaders, it's the business outcomes that you want to be focusing on. And a mandated return to the office saying, you know, three days a week, everyone back these days is not the best outcome at all. The best outcome that you'll get, the best practice, is a hybrid first team-led model, where the team decides together, the team leads together with the rest of the team, decide what works best for their team. Again, the team leads together with the team, decide what works best for their team. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Right? The team lead knows, together with the team members and each one, what their team needs and what the different team members are going to do well, whether they're going to do well in the office, whether they're going to do well at home, whether they're going to do well in the between, what the dynamics will be. And different teams have different needs rather than saying the whole organization has to come in three days a week. I've seen, for example, salespeople prefer, have a more of a preference to be in the office than IT people, let's say, and HR might be somewhere in the middle. So it really depends on the team members and their needs rather than just having a mandated return to the office from the top. 
different teams have different preferences, even within IT, as we saw, you know, 67% of you would prefer fully remote, a quarter of you would prefer hybrid, and 15% of you would prefer full-time in the office. So clearly, within IT, GRC, and auditing, there's still some disparity. But within other groups, there are disparities. So you want to customize it to each team and to each department, to each role, figure out what works best for the team. Hybrid employees should be the majority. We see that because for most people, it works best to come to the office for about a day a week, maybe. It's the majority, 60 to 90%, depending on the type of organization. If it's more of an IT organization, it might be 60%. It's more of manufacturing, it will be closer to 90%. And fully remote employees would be a minority, 10 to 40%, depending on the organization and the kind of activities that you're doing. And you want to adopt best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements before the team leads collaborate with team members on hybrid and remote work arrangements. You want to train them to train the team leads and team members on the cognitive biases and the future of work, the confirmation bias, the functional fixedness, the status quo bias, and the best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements, which we'll talk about next. And you should give them some broad guidelines. The amount of hybrid in office work should be based on collaboration. Establish a default of one day a week, which is good enough for team cohesion and collaboration, as we saw from the research side earlier. And you want to have team leads justifying additional days in the office so that they're not just imposing their personal perspective. So, you know, if they've been successful in the office for 30 years, therefore they just want to go back to the office. I've seen that happen and it's a problem. Fully remote options, who should have fully remote options? If you have teams whose leaders chose to go fully remote after discussing it with their team, obviously that's gonna be fully remote and hybrid teams. So for individuals and hybrid teams who are productive, disciplined self-starters when they're working remote. Those are the people who are best fit for remote, fully remote work when their whole team is not working remotely. And they should be told the potential career growth issues when the rest of the team is coming in occasionally and they're working remotely. They need to be effective self-advocates. And junior staff especially might be, have challenges with this because they may underestimate career growth issues as a result of remote work. You want to have team building retreats for fully remote teams. Oh, sorry about that. Team building retreats for fully remote staff once a quarter. So in the person, in the headquarters, I was just talking to a CHRO yesterday who told me that the on-site is the new off-site where they used to have off-sites and get people together in like fancy locations. But now the new off-site is the on-site where everyone just gets together in headquarters once a quarter. And it's exciting because it's people you don't see otherwise. So improves social bonds and trust and helps you plan group strategy. And that's the benefit of an offsite or benefit of an onsite quarterly team retreat. Now, let me share with you an example of an IT leader who implemented this hybrid first team led approach. So this is Dr. Craig Noblock, Dr. Craig Noblock the executive director of the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California, which is a 400 staff AI and other related information sciences research institute, very competitive field, you know how competitive AI is right now. And he's gonna share about his experience implementing this hybrid first model. Uh, Gleb Zabersky came, came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week. Uh, and then, you know, can work from home two days a week. Uh, and, and then I saw a video that Gleb actually, a uh, video talk that Gleb actually gave for our Triple E uh, that, really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And, uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and, 
uh, learn quite a bit more about you know how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and and allowing people to work from home. You know whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices. Uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. Okay. Now, I'm curious about your thoughts on this team-led approach. You should all see a poll, and I want you to think about how valuable would it be for you and your team members to integrate this team-led approach into your workplace. Please go ahead and vote. Most people voted. Let's give five more seconds for those who haven't made their voice heard. I just want to add a quick comment regarding the the question. It's I, th I think yes. we'll, we'll probably agree that the that the this approach is is the best approach. Although mm -hmm. I don't know that we have a whole lot of influence about the team led approach. Because in, in, in okay. most cases, it's dictated from senior management that what mm -hmm. what uh, what approach and model that will follow. Understood. Well, we'll be the, next. We'll get into breakout groups and discuss how you can encourage team if you think it's valuable. What you can do to encourage more of a team led approach. But let's finish up the poll and share the results. So most people clearly over two thirds of you think it's highly valuable, and a quarter think it's moderately valuable. Excellent. Glad to hear it. So now, as I mentioned, we'll get into breakout groups. And what I want you to think about is what impact, so first of all, talk about how, whether you would find it valuable. So most people would find it valuable, but you, you want to discuss that. What aspects of it would be more valuable, what aspects less. And then given if you do find some aspects of it valuable at least, what you can do to encourage the leadership team to adopt at least some elements of it. because of course you're not at the top you're in the middle kind of ranked and file but you can work with some people's managers have more flexibility than others to allow their team members to have more hybrid work you can also bring back some of this information and encourage leaders to have more flexibility push down the centralized decentralized decision making so that can be helpful. So that's what I want you to be talking about. Are there any questions about that? Uh, can you clarify the prompt? So like... Sure. So first discuss whether it is valuable. So most people, but not all, might find it valuable and what aspects of it might be most valuable. And then if you do find some aspects of it valuable, what can you do to encourage adoption of some aspects of this approach, at least some aspects, some elements of it, to have the decision-making be more team-led rather than top-down, what you can do to encourage this. OK, thanks. Sure. And of course, it, some of you might have more influence than others, and that's fine. And you'll learn from each other, and maybe you'll have to share some ideas. I definitely know that in other Isaka chapters I did, that this sort of discussion among people helped socialize and generate some ideas for what can be done to push toward a more effective approach to working from home, working from the office, the balance of hybrid work. OK, should all be able to join.
Okay, I think we're mostly all back. Good. Excellent. Okay. So, can whoever was the reporter for each team unmute yourself and share? Okay, so I'll go for my group. Thank All you, of Jeff. us saw the value in this approach. However, mm -hmm. none of us have the influence with mm. which to change it. Management retains 51% of the vote, and that's kind of the way it goes for almost all our organizations. Some of us are able to manage around it, like, you know, tell people, well, that doesn't really apply to you, and less of a notice is missing, but that was kind of what we came up with. Okay, fair enough. I understand. Sometimes there's nothing you could do. Appreciate that, Jeff. Tyra? Hey, so this is Tyra. Um, I was in group four. Mm -hmm. um, so there was four of us and we were basically split 50 50 uh two of our group members were given a, a survey and and basically took the approach to where the group can kind of decide to vote mm -hmm. and they would did their best to compensate you know each um survey res uh, results excuse me mm -hmm. um and then the other two we were just kind of told what to do um, the mm -hmm. upper management decided they were given no choice. However, they were given a choice on what day they could work mm -hmm. from home. So that was kind of, I think, a, a good balance. And then in my particular situation, um, for the on-site, my team is dispersed to the U.S., but we have a local office. So the on-site okay. just feel like we're just meeting strangers. So mm -hmm. ultimately, we all agree that having a survey and trying to accommodate because everyone is different is the best mm -hmm. course of action. Okay, excellent. And that's something to encourage the Part the companies that aren't doing that, leaders who aren't doing that to maybe consider doing that. Thank you. Okay, next. Hey, this is Elliot. Um, Hi, Elliot. Hey, um, our group did see value in it, um, mm -hmm. but similarly to the first group that shared is that we, mm -hmm. the, the top down um, seems to be the primary driver when it's mm -hmm. actually making the decision of can you do remote work can you you know mm -hmm. and if so, you know what what's the balance and what's what is the hybrid model that gets put in place okay. um but then the aspects that we found valuable is it does help the team building process because when you mm -hmm. involve the team and let them make the decisions everybody gets a voice they all get to discuss yeah. it helps open communications um, it helps teach the team how to reach out and connect and properly <laughs> communicate with each other in different ways to do it. Um, as you know, people move from getting sure. from the desk and going down the hall to, mm. does this person like Slack? Does this person like a phone mm. call? How to the different methods to stay in touch and communicate. Um, yeah. And then for the the last part of the the prompt was how do you convince leadership to do mm. buy? Um, you know, this was the the biggest challenge uh, we yeah. thought. Um, and it, it depends on the team, the company, the mm -hmm. culture that's in place. Um, yeah, but somebody has to take the initiative somewhere to to get the the, the idea out there and the conversation started, um, mm -hmm. and to start the conversation, start touting the positives of it, um, which mm -hmm. is culture, happiness, productivity, and a lot of the other things that we've discussed here today. Excellent. That's part. Of, that's how you get the conversation started. Thank you, Elliot. Great. Okay. Hopefully, it provides an inspiration to some other folks. All right, and the last team. Hi. Um, go Virginia. Ahead. Tom, Virginia. you go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we talked about um, that it's it's good because it uh, with the value of the being led by the employees or leaders mm -hmm. that within a team is the better buy-in. Um, letting yeah. them be part of the solution. But it also, I think the biggest, we were talking about the one, some of the things were the appreciation for some of the challenges, mm -hmm. you know, like um, if you're part of the conversation, then you also have to be owning, owning some of the solutions. Exactly. You have to have some sympathy to the company's cost and how mm -hmm. that changes because they have an investment in the office. Um, and we also talked about, you know, setting up your workstation and guidelines for, for that and how mm -hmm. much support are you going to get from the company? Um, mm -hmm. Even an equipment, like is it yeah. two monitors is some people uh, talked about. And I know in a couple of instances, the 
the employees just recognize the the productivity boost that they get by having <laughs> two monitors so they just buy it themselves mm. um so then that, that also then flips it the other side there needs to the company needs to understand that this is what people are doing in order to <laughs> uh accommodate as well so they're you know yeah. they're they're taking on some things that they're not even bothering you with because mm. they recognize that that helps them be productive that's a good, uh, definitely a good point. And that's the buy-in is really important as part of the discussion. Good, thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. Are there any questions before we move on to the next point? Okay, so now we're getting into a tactic that I think will be much easier for you to use than this team-led hybrid first model. I definitely, I always introduce a team-led hybrid first model, even in contexts where most of the people in the room may be unable to do more than get the conversation started, as Elliot was talking about, and encourage. But this next tactic is definitely something that can be done at an individual team level that requires no leadership in management input. This is how do you solve collaboration and build social capital during that period of time when you're working remotely. The large majority of you aren't in the office five days a week. You might be in the office four days a week, three days a week, two days a week, one day a week, or zero days a week. What about the time that you're not in the office? What do you do to build teamwork, collaborate effectively during that time? Well, this is a problem that I've heard a number of leaders tell me is a cause for them getting people in the office to facilitate collaboration. But you don't need to get people into the office to facilitate collaboration. You can use native first techniques that are actually quite helpful. One is to replace that in-person co-working where you are in an open office or a cubicle farm and you can chat to others around you with virtual co-working. What does that mean? It means you work alongside your team members on a video conference call, much like this one. So you dial into a Zoom or Microsoft Teams video conference call. It's for fully virtual teams or hybrid teams on the days that they're not in the office. And it's a, you just want to start with a one hour video conference call. And you start by sharing what you'll be working on. The crucial thing is this is not about collaborative work. This is about your own individual work, whatever you're programming, auditing, compliance reporting, doing research, whatever you're doing. You want to share the project on which you'll, maybe you'll be doing emails. Share the project on which you'll work, your own individual activities. Then you turn off your microphones like you're all doing right now. So thank you very much for keeping on mute. You leave your speakers on, again, like you're doing right now, and your video is optional. So people who are more extroverted may want to have it done. People who are more introverted may not. Then you do your work. Do your work for five minutes, work for 10 minutes. Then somebody has a question, issue, maybe a programming bug, maybe they're doing some compliance issues they want to, or auditing things that they want somebody's feedback on. You have a question, you have a problem, maybe you have an innovation idea how to do something differently. You turn on your microphone and you share that. And then you have a discussion back and forth with your team members for a couple of minutes, maybe if it's longer for five minutes, maybe somebody does screen sharing to share some ideas, do programming together. Your team members answer questions, solve problems, discuss ideas. Then you end that, and then you go on to work for another 5, 10, 15 minutes, and then there's another session of question answer. It just organically happens, and then you turn off your microphones and go on. And you might have you know three to four to five of these sessions throughout an hour. So you turn on your microphone at the end, and you share what you all accomplished in this period. This is really effective. It's help, very good for helping teams bond. So helping their team bonding, their team collaboration. It facilitates innovation because you can problem solve and figure out innovative ideas for processes. And it's especially helpful for junior team members, helping integrate them into the organization, into the team. It helps them see what the organization is about. It helps them build relationships, helps them build connections. So it's kind of on-the-job training where they can get their questions answered very quickly. Okay, now, oh yeah, so Pyro says virtual happy hours. 
not quite. So this is where you're actually not doing happy hour, you're actually working. <laughs> so what are your thoughts about this virtual co-working approach? How valuable would it be for you and your team to integrate this virtual co-working into your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. Again, this is something that you can do on all levels, fortunately. So this is not something you need your upper management for. Most of you voted. Let's give five more seconds for those who haven't. Great. So over a third would find it highly valuable, and about half of people would find it moderately valuable. Definitely good to see that. Excellent. And Tom said this can also work in team posts. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So we'll go into breakout rooms now. By now, you're kind of familiar with what this looks like. The goal is for you to discuss to what extent this will be valuable, moderately, highly, whatever. What value might you derive from parts of it, the whole approach, and then what you can do to integrate this into your team. Again, you're at the level where you definitely have influence. This can be a conversation with your manager to try this out for your team. So this is if you are a manager, obviously, you can do it easily. If you're not a manager, you can talk to your immediate manager. This does not de depend at all on high ups. This is something that a team decides on how they work together. So the conversation is, again, what aspects of this approach might be valuable for you, and then how you can integrate this into your organization, into your team. Uh, do you have any questions? Anyone has any questions on what you'll be discussing? Because we're getting into more nitty gritty discussions on practical things, I'm going to give a little bit more time for discussion. Okay, no questions. Please go ahead.
Okay, I see we are back. So let's have whoever is the reporter for each group. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go for group one. Yes, please go ahead. If you can hear. Yeah, I can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, now we can. I'll let you know when we can hear you. Okay, or somebody. Can... Okay, yeah. well, uh, we're yeah. team four. Um, yeah. For the most part, we didn't think that there would this would add much value, just mm -hmm. given that, um, like for example, for my team, and and again, Anthony was trying to speak. He's on my team, so I'd be curious to get his thoughts. Um, we have regular team meetings. We have regular meetings. We'll reach out. Hey, I have a question on this. Everybody's mm -hmm. usually available at any time. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's small teams working on each audit. Now it was mentioned in certain situations that can be beneficial, such as if there's new members to the team, junior yeah. members needing more guidance, then mm -hmm. that would be uh, definitely beneficial. Um, but, but again, I actually, I think this is interesting and I might take it back to my team and just get their thoughts on it and see what they think. If they think this would be something that's a good thing, or if they think that we have enough communication and collaboration that it's not adding additional value. Excellent. I can encourage you to experiment with it and see what it's like. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate that. Yeah. This, okay. this is Ryan in group two. Yeah. Uh, we all came to an agreement that it is um, virtual co-working is um, valuable mm -hmm. um, and but you have to have the right application um, mm -hmm. you know right you have to be on the same mission right same sure. similar type of job or you know that type of thing and in my yeah. case in my case I'm putting together a SOC team and um, I I'm going to be using this for mm. when I when I after I create the team or mm -hmm. you know through the process I'm going to be yeah getting them going. They're all new, newer employee, new employees. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, and I, you know, so I, I plan on doing that, but there was yeah. also a comment that management needs to say, you, you should support it in some way. Upper management in general should be able to support this. And I don't know why they would not support it. Yeah. Um, and especially if you have tools available, like, uh, teams mm -hmm. and Slack, you know, there's a uh, um, channels, for instance, option yeah. and team. Um, and so we, we, my company uses channels or my mm -hmm. IT department, we use the channels. Um, so, but um, yeah. I think that's, that's about it. That's mostly, and it, you know, we, we just agree that it's a, it's a great, great way to exchange ideas and mm -hmm. um, talk about process improvements and get feedback and, you know, Perfect. open open that up for, you know, for people to ask questions, so. Yeah, just no agenda, just a discussion. Excellent, Ryan, thank you. Yeah, definitely. I've never seen upper management be opposed to it. I mean, it's kind of an internal team matter how you organize it. Okay, Anthony, do you want to share your perspective? Yes, I'm back. I'm sorry, you just crashed on me. I had to restart. No it. worries. Um, yes, yeah, so everybody thought this was a good idea. Now we have in our department, we have twice weekly meetings. One will be on camera and one will be off camera. Many people were more introverted and they said, oh, no cameras. But I felt that the on camera kind of helped with our communication style. You know, mm -hmm. you smile, you listen, and everybody kind of chimes in. Um, and then one person made the point where having um, the meeting purposeful, so not just kind of rambling on, but have the meeting purposeful and not inundate people with meeting after meeting, have these meetings, you know, a couple of times a week, um, yeah. but make them purposeful. Um, you know, it's good for the new employees, especially when you need to share information. Um, so it, it works. Um, and then cross-functional teams between IT and finance, you know, you can always mm -hmm. bounce ideas off of one yeah. another, look at controls, look at control failures. It, it was useful for that. Um, sure. another person was an individual contributor mm -hmm. and they did not collaborate whatsoever with other mm -hmm. team members. So they felt it would be a good idea, um, 
you know, to collaborate and, and kind of bounce okay. ideas off of one another. Uh, okay. One one question I had was about the virtual mm -hmm. happy hour. <laughs> I thought that was yes. interesting. So that's that's done outside of work. It's done quarterly, and it's it's kind of like icebreakers, and they yeah. discuss their their accomplishments and you know what their gratitude. <laughs> you know, what, what, what they're grateful for. So I thought that was an interesting one that maybe we could incorporate, um, you know, just to, to kind of, you know, get away from the work um, aspect, although everybody's yeah. working remotely, but we can still have that social bond. Yeah, definitely. Virtual happy hours when they're up and have been quite useful. Excellent. Thank you, Anthony. And Michelle, this, I think, answers your question about the usefulness. Of it. <laughs> okay, and the last group. Yes, this is Sharon Lean for group three. Um, mm -hmm. We, uh, in our group, we pretty much um, discussed uh, that this virtual happy hour isn't something that we typically do. Um, it's, it seems like a fairly new concept, at least from what I've heard of, but it, it's very interesting. I mean, we, we have our normal, you know, weekly meetings and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but, um, but generally most of our take backs are um, when we have smaller group sessions you know between like two people that's great and everything but when you get a bigger group involved in this uh you mm -hmm. you are able to um let more individuals provide their feedback and mm -hmm. make it feel more like they're part of the team and um so so that's that's that part um but it is mm -hmm. definitely an interesting concept mm -hmm. and uh and uh, I was with uh, Elliot and Troy, and uh, mm -hmm. and and basically we just want to. You know, Troy had mentioned something about the fact of, you know, being able to uh, have a voice in these type yeah. of meetings. Um, and and that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. Didn't know if you guys wanted to include anything else. Okay, thank you, Charlene. Really appreciate that, and uh, I'm glad that the virtual co-working is going to be potentially helpful. Great. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions before we move on? Okay, no questions. Good. So we're at about halfway point, and this is a good time to take that hour long break. So it's 12.03. So be back at 105. I will see you at 105. And by the way, I forgot to mention, I put into the chat a link to hybrid work, hybrid slash remote work productivity. And so you should be able to see an article with a variety of links on this topic. All right, everyone. See you in an hour. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.
We'll start up in about a minute. Okay, I think it's about okay, I think it's about time to start up. Great. Hope everyone's here. So I'd like to start by just going around and seeing what were the key takeaways from the first part of the presentation for everyone. Let's see. Let's start. So if you can unmute yourself, or actually I'll just have uh, a ask people to share. You can say pass or not unmute yourself if you don't oh, feel that you want to share. But yeah, so go around. I'll just ask you to unmute yourself. Or you can put it in the chat if you want to share your key takeaways. So Elliot, would you start us off? Wow, right on the spot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, everyone, everyone will get to be on the spot. So <laughs> and you can always pass, not, not a big deal. Uh, my key takeaways have been that um, I liked how we touched on the framing, how we think, um, and trying mm -hmm. to change that that frame that a lot of our senior leadership has around that hybrid and remote is a detriment to the business, mm -hmm. as being an opportunity to be a, uh, you, you described it as disruptive behavior to change and improve yeah. how we do business and focus on the business objective and outcome rather than the disruption. Um, so, yeah, I think that was the key Thank takeaway. You. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Jin, uh, so if you would be willing to share. Oh, okay. My, <laughs> <laughs> my key takeaways are um, a couple interesting um, points that kind of I, I didn't think about. I think I kind <laughs> of got from this presentation. One is the one of the four horsemen. Uh, loss of diversity in mm -hmm. the geography. Yeah. And another point was the I think uh the 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 bias, the the what we call the three yeah. three types of um bias. Mm -hmm. I think even though they kind of fit into each other, but I think definitely give us yeah. a whole picture of why uh, they mm -hmm. you know what is the reason behind the senior management making such decision, so, yeah. Excellent, Thank you. that was helpful. Great. Ben Barense, you could tell me if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Ben, do you want to share? I see you unmuted yourself, so I was asking, but I can't hear you right now. So I'll move on to uh, Gina, Gina Bailey. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. 
Uh, one thing that I, I guess that uh, main take out uh, of this so far of this uh, CP is that uh, th there are ways to go ahead and try to combat this you know, reluctancy from management to actually mm -hmm. uh, allow uh, more more flexibility. Let's put it that yeah. way. Um, th there are ways. Yes, definitely. Uh, but I honestly, honestly, I, I think that it's going to be a tight kind of task. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, you know, it's, gonna... yeah. it's, it's something that you can change at the margin. It's not something that you and your role can change on the whole level, but you can definitely change it at the margin. And there are certain techniques that like virtual co-working, which you can do without any management, except mm -hmm. your local team leader. And we'll be talking about some more additional techniques like that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Troy? Oh, yeah. So takeaways, just uh, hear mm -hmm. you know, different perspectives on how everyone's working remote, some things that companies allow, some things that companies don't allow. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought it was interesting how people, you know, in a hybrid situation, you know, getting everybody back together at one time. And then yeah. one thing that was interesting was the fact that the time saved working remote, you know, some mm -hmm. for some hours, you know, two hours a yeah. day for their time. I'm um, just, just traveling back and forth to work. So yeah. yeah, just interesting to hear different perspectives from everyone. And people are willing to work some of that time, like around an average of 40% for their company. So it's definitely yeah. productivity improvement. Oh, yeah. One thing we found out in our last session that working remotely, there's no lines in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like it. I like it. <laughs> That's definitely true. <laughs> okay, Charlene. Hi there. <laughs> That's funny that Troy said that because uh, we got a good laugh about that last session. Um, I pretty much have to agree with him. I'm, I, I think that um, I definitely gained a new perspective on how, um, how remote working really works more for a lot of companies. And it's just yeah. been very interesting for me so far. I've learned some things about, wow, I didn't know this and I didn't know that. Um, so, so pretty much, yeah, just, just the metrics that you've used, like the percentages, I found that to be interesting so far. And, um, and it's just, it's been quite very valuable to me so far and yeah. I have good takeaways that I can bring back to my management team. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Excellent. Glad to hear it, Charlene. Okay. Let's see. Anyone else wants to go next or should I call in people? Um, let's say. Kristen, Kristen Christo, uh, if that's the way you pronounce your name, would you be willing to share? Sure. Yes, that's how you say it. Okay. Say it's my rock star name. <laughs> okay, there you uh, go. <laughs> um, one of the things that was or has been beneficial to me is just learning from all the different participants mm -hmm. and how yeah. their companies are operating. Um during some of the discussions, um, because we are, my company is a hybrid. So we okay. only do, we're two and three. And mm -hmm. so hearing how others have actually gone totally remote or have been totally remote um, has just given me some good perspective on what I can bring back to my team, so. Excellent, I'm glad to hear it, Kristen. This is why this is structured in a modular fashion because I present some information that's based on external benchmarks in my work with a number of companies, but then you talk to your colleagues and you get to see the in-depth picture of what's going on from their perspective. So kind of peer learning is very valuable. Jeff. Uh, some of the techniques that you use for dealing with remote folks, mm -hmm. since um, we're truly hybrid in that, you know, most of us are in the office five mm -hmm. days a week, but we're dispersed around okay. the country. So uh -huh. we operate in a different kind of hybrid environment. Mm -hmm. We're here, but we're not all together. So yeah, some of these techniques could be useful here too. Absolutely. And then I'll go into one soon that you'll be, that has been very helpful for co-working, virtual co-working, quite helpful. And one I'll go into next about innovation has also been very, very helpful. Okay. Who well, hasn't spoken uh, yet? Hey, this is Tyra. Tyra. <clears throat> yes, Tyra, please. So what was eye-opening to me was obviously your statistics, you know, about mm. the pr productivity of um, yeah. working from home, because I think, don't think a lot of people see it that way. 
<clears throat> and then the other thing is just obviously hearing other people's perspectives and their situations. And it kind of makes me grateful for the situation I have because it's like, well, you know, it could be worse. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> Shift your expectations. And uh, like I said, I put a link in the chat to anyone who wants the statistics on hybrid and remote work productivity. If you want to share that around with your management team, with your colleagues, that might be helpful. Yeah, definitely. And the other thing was that like somebody mentioned they were sick, but they still worked because they're at <clears throat> home. So that yep. is a big plus that a lot of people don't really take into account because I've done that several times with a sinus infection or whatever. So mm -hmm. it's much easier yeah. to handle work at home when you're not feeling well than in the office. Absolutely. And that's why I use when I talked about measuring the metrics of your figuring out the return to office hybrid work sick days is one of the metrics i advise my clients to use because that definitely differs whether you're allowing flexibility or not okay jose yeah um for me i think the big thing was the the uh, the data regarding you know the the productivity the the advantages mm -hmm. of I think my my main concern is the senior management is still going back to that uh, wanting to get people on site, uh, yeah. you know, more consistently. Uh, I mentioned to some of the teams that I was working on. I think they're driven more from a, a real estate investment perspective mm -hmm. than anything else because they already have invested in the property and, and the enhancements and the growth, and and now there's nobody there to to fill those <laughs> seats. Uh, and then I think. To your point, the the kind of the philosophy or approach for management that it's still getting back to what they consider to be a status quo mm -hmm. how it was, uh, and particularly you know for us because we're we're a bank, I think there's yeah. that sense that we need to be there um, mm -hmm. to to you know kind of meet with customers and stuff like that. But you know that's only for a few a very small population sure. that has that kind of customer interface. You know, a large majority of the population is still uh, dispersed, distributed team environments where, uh -huh. you know, even if I go in the office, I'm not meeting with anybody on my team or, or my business partners. Yep, that certainly makes sense. And I've worked with uh, several banks which had the idea that they need to go to the office to meet customers and indeed some customers like that. But there are many customers that nowadays prefer more virtual meetings and uh, you can actually get to more senior level people and your customers if you do B2B, of course, uh, banking. So there's people who are, would not have met with bankers earlier. So there's definitely some benefits to having virtual meetings with customers and knowing, being trained on how to engage with customers, providing customer service, sales, and so on virtually. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Anthony, I saw that you were, wanted to share. Oh, yeah. So um, I like the cognitive biases piece you know, functional fixedness um you know how how sustainable are these models going to be in the long term how are they going to attract younger talent or future talent how are they going to retain talent um you know that old school management has to go away but it you know in my mind it, i'm playing devil's advocate because it has to be dependent on the industry like we, mm -hmm. we were in breakout rooms with people that were in manufacturing and there was no way that they could work remotely sure um but then it's kind of like a all or nothing like all everybody has to work remotely or everybody has to be on site kind of thing but mm -hmm. if management sees the pros and cons let's say if, if it's a cost savings to them for you know building overhead expenses um, why not send 30 percent of your team uh, you know remotely so you know, again, it depends, but still, you know, getting away from those biases and, and thinking about the future, long-term retention, that type of thing. Absolutely. And in terms of man, in terms of the type of company, type of role, there are a number of manufacturing companies that do just f completely flexible work. So here's an article about 3M. Trust-based approach that allows 3Mers around the world to work their way, which talks about them being the future of work isn't necessarily come to the office. Let's employees create a schedule that helps them work when and where they want most effectively. And that's an example of a major manufacturing design research company that does this. I also have a number of clients who are not the name of the 3M, but also large companies, manufacturing companies that are quite flexible. So there's definitely, it 
just because some people are in the office doesn't mean that have to be on the shop floor, doesn't mean that everyone has to be on the shop floor or in the face-to-face -face in the retail with customers. Okay, Katina, uh, would you like to share? Okay, I'll skip you then. Susan oh. Hayes, okay. I'm sorry, were you talking? I thought you no, said uh, Gina or Christina? No, uh, Katina. K-A-T-I-N-A. Oh. But thank you, Jean. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Susan Hayes, would you be willing to share? Susan, I see you unmuted yourself, but we can't hear you. I'll let you know when we can hear you. Jeff, would you like to share in the meantime? Jeff Malfant? Not at this time. Okay. Andre? Yeah, hey. Um, I think my, um, I like all the statistics that mm -hmm. kind of support what's going on because like you mentioned some of the people like larger companies and you know you hear about elon musk and some of these other people um forget the guy from one of the big banks in new york also like oh we got we got everybody's got to be back in the office and all that yeah. stuff jamie diamond yeah jamie diamond yeah so you know i was interesting then that professor from usc you know he was just going to go with the flow and then mm -hmm. You know, it was good that he had a reflective moment and said, well, maybe I should dig into this a little bit more. And I think there's, a, you know, it goes to what you were saying around including employees in it. And in his case, he used mm -hmm. a consultant that had a lot of, in, in, uh, you know, data on it. So to help him get to a better place. So I think that's all good. I did share during the break with my boss the, um, that technique of, of doing the video and having everybody on there as if it's oh, like yeah. a virtual round table. And yeah, I mean, she was really, uh, she really liked the idea. So Good. see what happens. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear it already. Immediate takeaway. <laughs> Great to hear yeah. it. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Want to share? Uh, Michelle, would you like to share? Sure. I think that just basically the takeaway so far, again, it, it, interesting to hear other people's perspectives, like mm -hmm. other, others have mentioned, and also just reinforcing, I think, that um, what we're doing works. And mm -hmm. also, if we were ever to be questioned about being remote, again, there's that statistical information that's available that supports um, that we are productive, um, you know, and, and so that's been my takeaway. Excellent. And as Anthony mentioned, the virtual coworking might be a nice idea. Okay, good. Uh, Ezekiel, would you be willing to share? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think it's it's been really uh, insightful hearing from you and from everyone. Um, <laughs> the the one thing that sticks out to me was uh, when you were talking about how um, the cost of attrition and, uh, you know, for mm -hmm. my company, one of the incentives that they've given us is they've given us, uh, you know, free lunches to come on uh, mm -hmm. on Wednesdays and on Tuesday, yeah. Thursday, you get like other fringe benefits and a social on a Wednesday. And um you know, at, at first I was just thinking it's a good way to connect people together, but then uh, how you put it, it's actually by having those additional benefits, it's actually, it, it costs significantly less to keep your yeah. people, you know, so I thought that was exactly. pretty cool. And also, and also the, um, I really like how you talked about um, having um, periodic surveys just to mm -hmm. get a gauge of, you know, the temperature, right, of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of, yeah. of the back to work. So uh, I know we've done surveys before going to, going back to the office, but um, doing a periodic survey, I think, would be definitely helpful. Excellent. And that's an easy tip to bring to your management team, HR team yes. management team. Great. Ryan Warner? Yeah, uh, my key takeaway is that uh, companies really, big and small, need to really embrace um, working remote. I mean, to stay competitive and to get the best yeah. talent and from anywhere in the world, really. Um, you know, there's... I like I like all the details you you provided um, about the studies showing that you know that it improves overall well being work life balance friendships relationships so it's it, it's a win win really so 
Absolutely. Excellent. Good to hear that. And Tyra? Oh, I already went. Oh, I'm sorry. You did, <laughs> you did go. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, I think Ben Barense and Susan Hayes didn't go, but I know you might have mic issues. If either of you wishes to go, you can unmute yourself and share. Anyone else who well, haven't gotten to it in spot, let me know as well. All right, then let's go on. So I promised I would share a technique about innovating. This is useful for distributed teams, people who are in the office full time or in the office part of the time or hybrid or fully remote. Whether it's distributed, whether you're fully remote, whether you're hybrid, this is innovation is a major issue. I've seen many companies say that they want to go to the office for the sake of innovation. And of course, the traditional method of innovation is brainstorming, where you get together in a room and you just show, share ideas about a topic, kind of brainstorming, engagement with each other. It has some benefits, so it has some upsides and some downsides, but I want to share a technique that's actually been shown to be quite a bit more effective, even if you're working in person, which is called virtual asynchronous brainstorming. Traditional brainstorming is useful for innovation, as I mentioned. It has what's called synergy, which is not the corporate speak so much. So this is about research on this topic. So synergy is where you have an idea that's inspired by somebody else. In other words, somebody shares an idea and it inspires you to have an idea that you wouldn't have had otherwise. It also benefits from social facilitation, which is you are excited by being in a room with people who are sharing ideas, you can get on the same page, you have more alignment. But it has some serious problems. One is called production blocking. Production blocking is when you have an idea, but other people are talking about a different topic in the brainstorming session, and your idea gets away from you and you lose the idea. So it's blocking of production of ideas. Another is called evaluation apprehension. That's where you have an idea, but you're worried about sharing it because it might implicitly criticize someone else or it might be seen as too out of the box. And so you're worried about the evaluation of others. And another is social loathing. So the more people that are in the room, the less intuitively intuitive it is for us to work harder with generating ideas. So social loafing is our tendency to not work as hard when there are more people in the room. Virtually synchronous brainstorming is a great technique that solves all of these problems. It's especially helpful for people who are junior and lower status team members. Why is that? Well, they tend to have more production blocking. They don't want to interrupt higher status team members, more experienced ones who are talking, whereas junior fresh team members often have the most innovative novel perspectives to share. They also suffer from evaluation apprehension because they don't want to lose social status and reputation from implicitly criticizing someone or having an idea that's too off the wall. They feel not confident enough yet. And again, they might have the freshest, most innovative ideas. For introverts, for introverts, it's kind of difficult to do brainstorming. When you're in the room, other people are talking, you can't hear yourself think. Introverts like to process their ideas and kind of think about them on their own. That's often an aspect of in being introverted. Not always, some people, introverts aren't. But that is something that's a blocker for introverts and pessimists. So people who are pessimistic tend to want to think about their ideas before they're perfect, while to get them to a state of perfection. And so they have a lot of evaluation apprehension about sharing an idea that doesn't seem well fleshed out, well thought out. So for introverts, pessimists, and junior lower status team members, the traditional brainstorming doesn't work very well. It's never worked very well. So even before the pandemic, way before the pandemic, in the early 1990s, there were techniques developed to address these problems. And I took these techniques and adapted them into a new technique called virtually synchronous brainstorming, which I have a Harvard Business Review article about that talks about how to do this activity in a remote setting. You can also do this there's part of it that you can do in person, but this is about a remote innovation. How do you do that effectively? The first step for virtual asynchronous brainstorming is you generate and input your ideas 
asynchronously, so not at the same time, and anonymously without other people knowing it, into Google Forms, into a mural, into Microsoft Forms, into some kind of digital repository of ideas. Now, it's crucial for it to be asynchronous and anonymous. Asynchronicity is very helpful to address production blocking because you're not producing your ideas at the same time that other people are. So it's very helpful for introverts and people who are lower status. Then anonymity is very helpful for pessimists because now they don't have to worry about evaluation apprehension. And it's helpful for people who are lower status. Again, don't have to worry about evaluation apprehension. That's the first step. You generate ideas, then you have maybe a mural form, but more usually mural, you use it when it's more of a visual thing. Otherwise, Microsoft Forms or Google Forms, so you have a spreadsheet with ideas. So let's say you have a six people team, each came up with 10 ideas, and then let's say 10 are duplicative. So the facilitator cleans up the spreadsheet and now you have 50 ideas in the spreadsheet. Now, the facilitator, give, so I, I've done a lot of these facilitations, as you can imagine. So then you give a spreadsheet, an empty sp the spreadsheet with ideas to all the team members. So each team member gets their own copy and then they fill out their copy anonymously, commenting on it and reviewing it. You, you evaluate quantitatively each idea on a scale of zero to five on categories that your team comes up with. A good default is how innovative it is, how practical it is, how exciting it is. So those could be three good categories, but you can choose whatever other categories you want. And then you also can leave comments in the notes section. Okay, so now you have a spreadsheet with six people, for the six people team commented on each one. So each of these ideas is rated from zero to 15 within each person. And so you have six people, so each idea gets anywhere from zero to 90. So zero times six and 15 times six, plus comments. Now the facilitator, ideally you want an external facilitator so the team leader can fully participate, but if we need to just have the team leader participate as leading the, the activity and also being a participant, then you have a synchronous meeting to determine implementation. Now. At this point, it's pretty clear what the best ideas are. So you can have a cutoff point. You could say, well, 0 to 75, we don't consider those. Only ideas that are above 75 will be considered. And so the best ideas float to the top. And you'll be surprised how often they come from junior people. So you have a synchronous meeting at this time. If you are able, it's best to have this in person because you'll want to read other people's body language and nuance. But if you can't, obviously it's fine to have a virtual meeting. I've done plenty of facility, plenty of these virtually. And you just decide the ideas and the next steps for implementation. You can, of course, edit the ideas based on feedback that you have in the notes section and the discussion. And we have peer reviewed research showing that this type of activity results in more total ideas and more novel ideas than traditional brainstorming. Now, at this stage, you, I will put a link into the chat with a Google form. And what I want you to put into the Google form is optionally your name and then your idea for how you can use this technique. So this is the spreadsheet, this is the form that you'll see when you click on the link, which is in the chat. So where can you and your team use virtually synchronous brainstorming is the prompt. So put in as many ideas you have, as you have for using it, but put in one idea at a time to make sure that they appear separately on the resulting spreadsheet. For each separate idea, input the information that submit the form, then go back to the form once more and submit your next idea. You can choose whether or not to put your name so that other people appreciate the value of your input. The first question is optional. Now, after we do this, I will send the spreadsheet around to every participant. So you'll have all the results of the ideas from everyone in the meeting. So it will co-create the activity. So you'll, a nice thing to do is put in your name so you know who gets credit for each idea, but you don't have to. And so this is something that you can decide to do when you're doing this spreadsheet, you can, when you're doing it within your team. 
just make the name optional and people can choose to put their name in, could choose to not put their name. That's always that's useful. If you want people to be forced to put their name in, you can also make it a forced function and obligatory one. But in the meantime, do you have does anyone have any question about what we'll be doing now? So we'll be taking five minutes to do this activity, put in some ideas that you have for using this in your teams, in your context. Okay, don't think anyone has any questions. So please go ahead. I have set a timer for five minutes. So please go ahead and fill out your ideas, five minutes. A full aspect of this activity when you're doing it virtually is that you can actually see the spreadsheet being filled out in real time. So you have some people who are, have shared some ideas. So please go ahead, continue sharing your ideas. You still have four minutes.
Okay, good. Oh, actually, let me share the screen again. Look how many ideas we have. So we have a someone put in a bunch of ideas into one. So we have over 35 ideas. Excellent. Good. So let me do this. So in the chat, you will see the spread, link to the spreadsheet with ideas. So this is for you. This is a co-created activity. We created this together and you take this and apply it to whatever needs you have. Okay, let's do a little poll, um, virtual asynchronous brainstorming. How valuable do you think now that you've thought about it, that you have the spreadsheet, do you think it will be helpful for you, how valuable would it be for your work? Please, please go ahead and vote. About half of the people voted. Five more seconds. Okay, great. So over a quarter find it highly valuable and three quarters moderately valuable. Excellent. Good. Now we'll have an opportunity to discuss where and how you can find valuable and use it. Okay. We will be going into breakout rooms again. And so the goal is to discuss where this technique might be valuable and how you can integrate it. So both of those. So again, just like virtual co-working, this does not depend at all on the highest level management. I can't imagine that will oh, ban, ban you from using this. So this depends just on the team manager working with her or his team members or their team members and deciding that they want to use this and that they want to apply it and then just going ahead and applying. It. So this is quite, quite useful. Again, useful for teams that are all remote, useful for teams that are in the office part of the time. So hybrid teams, useful for distributed teams and useful for even fully office-centric teams that don't want to uh, run into the traps of traditional brainstorming with a production blocking, evaluation, apprehension, and social logic. Any questions about what we'll be doing right now? All right, no questions, great. Opening the rooms.
All right, everyone. I think everyone's back. Great. So, uh, whoever is the reporter for each one, please unmute yourself and share your thoughts. Kristen. Um, so we talked about, and some of this was added to the spreadsheet when we did our um, mm -hmm. updates, but uh, we discussed using it for um, kind of talking about team dynamic, any issues that you're having mm -hmm. in the department, that it's a good way that people can express themselves anonymously without having to, you know, say where it came from. Mm -hmm. Another great idea that came up was to use it as a almost a post project or post implementation tool of kind of okay. lessons learned, like what we do right, what we do wrong. Um, and that way, so that people can, you know, freely express mm -hmm. kind of how they feel things went, you know, yeah. if you feel, if your manager or whoever is running the project and you feel like you can't really speak freely, then that might be a good way um, mm -hmm. to kind of get that across. And then, the other thing we kind of talked about is it, it can be used differently based on kind of the number of people in your department. You know, if you have four mm -hmm. people, maybe it's not the best tool, but if you have 20, 40, 50, and if you're distributed in other places, then it may mm -hmm. make a lot more sense. So hmm. I've used seen it used well with four people also. It depends on the team dynamics. Right. So, but, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Great. I'm glad to hear it, Kristen. All right. Thank you. Next. Uh, this is uh, Ryan, uh, Group Two. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we came up with um, uh, use cases where we could uh, gather ideas for technical mm -hmm. problems, um, uh, express concerns about department mm -hmm. issues, yeah. uh, and brainstorm about you know making um, process improvements. So, excellent. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, Tom. Yeah, so team four, we uh, mm -hmm. talked about being used for team decisioning, process mm -hmm. improvement and streamlining, um, ideas for improvement of the team and team engagement. Um, mm -hmm. We felt like it wasn't though a good tool for like visual representation. So yeah. we thought like whiteboard sessions would be better served for that. So we kind of felt like this is more analog versus uh, a visual digital, I guess. I don't know. But uh, yeah, we kind of also looked at this uh, akin to sort of like a agile or stand up meeting kind of methodology. It's you can use this in whiteboard. That's why I mentioned mural, mural or other whiteboard tools that provide anonymity. That's you can definitely use it for that purpose in those sorts of contexts. But yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Oh, OK, thanks. Yep. And last but not least, who was the reporter for the last group? Charlene? Uh, I guess you could say I was a reporter. <laughs> um, sorry, I apologize for the background noise. Um, basically, we were just talking about uh, like one of my my biggest things was, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you got some people that are very shy, don't wanna mm -hmm. express themselves, you know, depending if they ask a question or something. Yeah, you know, any question you could, you, know, you got to start off by saying there is no silly question. We want all your feedback. We want all your input. We want to make <laughs> people feel like they're part of the conversation yeah. um, and that type of thing. That was that was mostly what we had talked about. I believe that was it. Excellent. And this tool is a great way for shy people, for introverted people to express themselves. Okay, good. Are there any other questions about using this technique? Okay, so it's 205. So let's take 15 minutes and be back at 220. I'll see you then.
We'll be starting up in a minute. Okay, I think it's time to start up. Good, hopefully everyone's back. Let's talk about solving another series. So we're talking about solving collaboration and innovation. I will talk about another series of challenges that I see associated with hybrid work and remote work. Burnout, proximity bias, and accountability. So these are all interconnected and I'll talk about their inter interconnection. These are serious challenges, and it's another reason why many leaders want to get their employees into the office. But they don't have to be solved, as I'm guessing you guessed by now. They don't have to be solved simply by getting people into the office to address burnout, to address proximity bias, to address accountability and performance management. Proximity bias, you probably heard this term. It combines worries by hybrid and remote workers about career advancement. So the idea that if you're working some or all of your time remotely, and some people are spending more time in the office than you, perhaps they're building closer relationship with leaders and peers, and they are politicking their way up, maybe even unintentionally, it's just relationship building. They're going to get higher and further career advancement. On the other hand, people who are forced to be spend more time in the office compared to people who have more flexibility, well, people who are forced to spend more time in the office can have a sense of envy toward workers who have more flexibility for a hybrid remote and so on. So both of those are captured in the phrase of proximity bias. To address proximity bias, you want to be thinking about a culture of excellence from anywhere, a culture of excellence from anywhere. And this is something that is it's great if you're in a managerial role, but this can also be implemented to some extent, at least within a team setting, because the goal is to shift from focusing on time spent work to focus on outputs and deliverables, not inputs, not where you work. It helps address envy to the extent that there's this differences in flexibility, because it's not about location, it's about outcomes. So we have already talked in this presentation about some people being in office, some people being remote, and there being concerns that, well, if we have some people who are forced to be in the office, let's say from factory workers or in retail chains, or maybe they have to meet clients, receptionists, and whatnot, then everyone needs to be in the office. And uh, that idea that everyone needs to be in the office is a solution to proximity bias, <laughs> not the best solution. The culture of excellence from anywhere is a much better solution. Focus on outputs and deliverables, not where you work, helping address envy. It's not about locations, it's about outcomes.
but it also helps address burnout. Burnout often comes because people who are working most or all their time remotely are worried about being perceived as slackers, not productive. So they're working too hard and too much. Now, it's not a bad thing to work hard for in a sustainable fashion. You don't want to work hard so hard that you, know, you can work on a project in an emergency for a you know, month or two, maybe a, a week, two weeks, a month to ship something. But you don't want to make it like a quarter or something like that. You don't want to make it consistent because people will just burn out. And it helps provide accountability with a focus on predetermined weekly goals. So let's talk about those weekly goals. This is about performance management through small scale frequent evaluations. Small scale weekly evaluations at weekly one on one, small scale performance evaluations. It's really beneficial. So, all good managers already have weekly or every other week meetings with their team lead, with their team members. This just adds a performance management element to it. And again, this is something that can be implemented relatively easily within a team without requiring top level approval, company wide policy. And this approach, so you can do it at your team level. It helps team members always know where they stand and gives them psychological safety, so comfort, which improves retention and, of course, career growth. It prevents workers who are working in a hybrid or remote setting from overworking and burning out because they have anxiety over how they're perceived. What it involves is the team member and the supervisor agreeing on three to five weekly goals. So you have a weekly one-on-one, -on -one, you have three to five weekly goals that you agree on. And ideally, they're going to be smart, specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and timely, but they don't have to be. So let's say you're in auditing and you agree you're going to do a certain part of an audit that would be one goal. Another goal would be to deal to, to set a number of meetings with the team members with whom you're going to be auditing and to have meetings to build up a relationship or kind of address some challenges, thing, dynamics or something like that. Programming, it's obviously you know, you're going to program something, GRC, whatever you're doing in compliance, you know, getting a certain amount of compliance activities done. So a team member, you'll send your supervisor a report on what you accomplished in your goals, any problems that you solved, and a self-evaluation 24 hours before your upcoming one-on-one. -on -one. So you'll have one week, you'll have six days to do it, then you'll send the report. And then the one-on-one, -on -one, the team lead evaluates the performance, coaches the team member on problem solving, affirms or revises the evaluation, and sets the goals for the next week. Now, are there any questions about this technique? If there are no questions, then we'll go into, uh, let me do a poll first. I'll be curious what your thoughts are and how valuable do you think this would be to integrate this methodology to align with hybrid work instead of the typical performance evaluation, which is kind of more but in seat evaluation. It's about half of you vote, five more seconds, make your voice heard. Great. So over a quarter would of you would find it valuable, and over two and over a half of you would find it moderately valuable. Excellent. Good to hear that. Great. So we'll do breakout rooms like we did before. You should be pretty familiar with the dynamics by now. So again, choose someone to be a reporter. We'll be talking about what elements of this technique might be valuable for you and how you can encourage your team lead if you're not the team lead and your team, your organization to implement. If you're the team lead, talk about how you would implement it and any concerns you might have, any activities that you can integrate into it. So think about how it might be relevant and useful to you to implement at least some aspects of it in your more small scale performance evaluations with your manager. And remember the previous part, the culture of excellence from anywhere. So focus on outcomes and deliverables away from inputs and where you work and addressing proximity bias. Questions about what we'll be discussing.
All right. Please go ahead. Get to the rooms.
Okay, I think most of us are here. I think we're all here now. Okay, great. So, please, whoever is from each room, uh, the reporter, unmute yourself and share your perspective on um, what the room talked about. Ben. All right. I'll go first. Um, we've we discussed and found that it would be useful, especially from a project management uh, standpoint mm. for smaller teams. Yeah. But we're concerned that larger teams, it may be a little preventative with the uh, managerial overhead for time. Mm. Um, <laughs> but it would be helpful if the the planning is thorough enough and that there are good quality measurable goals that are created. Um, and those measurable goals for certain individuals on some teams would be beneficial to incentivize um, higher output and uh, mm -hmm. goal-minded uh, thought processes. Excellent. And that would help uh, not simply incentivize, but coordinate people. One of the biggest challenges I see with remote work, hybrid work, is people are less coordinated because you don't have those in the office meetings. So this helps coordinate people. For larger teams, it's a matter of just doing it less frequently. So if your manager span management span of control is 15 people, then doing it every two weeks instead of one week, if your management span of control is seven people. Yeah, that was a question Excellent. we actually had was, was there a number that you found that fits well for weekly or, and once you go over that, do you need to spread it out? Like we I, Yeah, generally over eight people, you want to spread it out to every two weeks. Thank you. Hmm. Sure. So you don't want to spend more than, I mean, it's going to be like half day. So if it's eight people, that's half hour meeting, you're going to, that's half of your day. That's a fine amount of time to spend meeting and coordinating with people. If it gets over that, it's per week, of course. If it gets over that, it might be a little bit complex. So I'd suggest expanding it to over two weeks if you have a larger span of control. Charlene. Hey there. Uh, we pretty much discussed, uh, you know, routine work versus makeup work. Mm -hmm. it, it's all going to depend on the company uh, or the institution, mm -hmm. the firm that you work for, um, and in, uh, in our opinion. And uh, and one thing that we found to be uh, real valuable would be getting your new hires or inexperienced individuals mm -hmm. uh, more involved in the culture. Uh, yeah. so, so that would be a good thing for them, um, and encourage your survive, uh, your supervisor goal, uh, progress, uh, you know, give them maybe just a quick, shoot them just a quick little email about this is what I'm mm -hmm. going to do for the week and stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, personal opinion, uh, just, just personally here, not speaking for anybody else. Um, it's, it's. I think it would be very hard for me to go back to my managers and say, uh, we need to do this on a weekly basis as far as, uh, sure. uh, as far as, um, you know, like, um, like a progress report or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea. I just don't know mm -hmm. if, uh, if they would buy it because of all the other meetings that they got going on during the week, generally, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, do we definitely do our annual evaluations but to do something weekly um not really sure if they, if they would if they would go for that but it's a good idea well you can tell them that's a good idea and you can see what you can work out i mean some teams do it weekly some teams do it every two weeks some teams do it once a month it depends on your dynamic what i find is that once managers start using it they see that it actually helps them cut down the number of meetings because they find that their teams are performing better and they're better coordinated. So they actually need less meetings. They're spending less time communicating and troubleshooting other issues. So that's been my finding and I've done this for a number of companies. Yes, that make, I agree with you. Excellent. Okay, uh, next group. I mean, I can go, we were team four. Yeah. Um, so. I think we had some concern at this level of detail, meeting mm -hmm. weekly and having the three to five goals, uh, someone might feel like they're being micromanaged. So oh. it might have the opposite effect. Um, mm -hmm. I think that what a lot of us already currently do is have biweekly meetings where we're kind of mm -hmm. having status updates and things like that. And of course there's regular conversation if anybody has any issues 
but would just be concerned, especially for high performers, that they would mm -hmm. feel like, like this is might be some micromanaging. Now, if for newer team members, as was mentioned, we think it's a great idea. And obviously, if there's um, employees that are having performance issues, then this would mm -hmm. be, be very good. But in general, for the, you know, your regular high performing employees, again, just think it might, this might have the opposite effect of what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, definitely want to customize it to the employees. So for the um, Information Sciences Institute with Dr. Craig Noblock, they instituted this at a monthly basis because the researchers that are working with AI, AI researchers do a lot more independent work. Whereas if your team does a lot more coordination, collaboration, it might be helpful to do it weekly. If you do a little bit less coordination and people, you trust them to perform, and you don't worry about this coordination, then every two weeks or something like that might be helpful. So you want to, of course, customize it to the person and their own. I, that's why I suggest weekly or bi-weekly. It really depends and you want to customize it to the person. And monthly, if you are have a lot of independence. So for example, also at the managerial level. So when you're a manager meeting with your supervisor, if you're a lower level manager meeting with a higher level manager, I find that monthly generally works well, or like a CEO meeting with a C-suite. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Thank and you. the last, you're welcome, the last group. So I'm not sure if my group went, this is Tyra, I think I was in group one. Okay. But I could have sworn the last person that talked was in our meeting because that's exactly what we said. <laughs> <laughs> um, the fact that the high performers would be feel micromanaged, um, mm -hmm. the newcomers and the less experienced would benefit from that type of mm -hmm. you know involvement, and that it would burden the leadership, you know, if they had to do that across the board. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you know all of those things are are exactly how we feel about this situation for small scale okay. evals. Okay, great. Well, we talked about this uh, and you want, need to adapt it to your team and it, the managers will eventually will find that it actually cuts down the effort over time. Okay, good. Let's go on to addressing another problem, which is junior staff. So you've probably heard people like Mark Zuckerberg at Meta, Mark Benioff at Salesforce saying that Junior staff are performing badly, therefore we need to go back to the office. Well, that's not the, some, you don't need to have everyone go back to the office because junior staff are performing badly, first of all. Second of all, you can actually effectively integrate junior staff if you do it thoughtfully, even in a mostly remote setting, although I do recommend that junior staff spend more time in the office. So hybrid work results in a major challenge. We clearly see that there are more close-knit connections to one's own team, but you have weakening connections to other teams and to the organizational culture as a whole. So it's definitely an acknowledged challenge of hybrid work, of time spent working remotely. So the best solution for is to establish a hybrid mentoring program because you already, if you're a high performer, if you've been in the company for a while, you already have connections to other teams and to the organizational culture as a whole, but it's especially a big problem for men, for people who need mentoring, for people, so not onboarding, not the first three months, but the three to five, three months to five year period. Those are the proud people who have a lot of challenges. So you want, as part of your hybrid mentoring program, to have two mentors, a senior staff member who is not the supervisor, but from their own team, and someone else from another part of the organization. The mentor from your own team helps junior employees with on-the-job training and with team bonding. Whereas the mentor from the other part of the organization helps junior members, team members with forming connections across the organization and integration into the culture of the organization. So both mentors should meet with a mentee at least once a month. And that should be mostly fine, 20, 30 minutes, ideally in person if possible. And do remote co-working sessions at least once a week. So it's not much of a burden on the mentor. Actually, focus time, 20 to 30 minutes, ideally in person, and then co-working sessions where you're working on your own tasks, but you're helping the mentee 
of, as they have questions. So your maybe your efficiency goes down by 20% during that period, 10 to 20%. So this is something that has really helped a number of companies that I've worked with solve the integration of junior staff members. And I want to ask you with a poll, to what extent do you think this might be helpful for you to integrate junior staff members? About 50% of the people voting. Let's give five more seconds. Okay, so this is actually a little bit more popular than the previous one. We have just under half the people see it as highly valuable and just over half of the people see it as moderately valuable. That's excellent. Okay, so we will do the breakout rooms again to discuss how and where you could implement this technique in your own teams. What might be valuable about it, how you can implement it, and again, even if you are in the local, even if you're rank and file, you don't have influence outside of your team, you can certainly implement this within your team and have some, at least one mentor, ideally two mentors from within your team. And what I find is that when managers are trying to implement it themselves, they can tag team with other managers and exchange mentors from that team to get have someone as a mentor from another team for their own staff members and vice versa. So there are definitely ways to do it and implement. And I want to see if there are any questions about what we're gonna be doing about this technique before we go on. Uh, so to clarify the prompt yes. to the value of adding mentors for junior staff to help integrate them into the team and company? Yes, specifically, the, right, specifically the two mentor approach, one from your own team and one from outside the team, which helps address the weakening of connections to other teams and to the organizational culture as a whole, but that junior staff members are more, it's more difficult for them to build those connections when they're not spending lots of time in person. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please go ahead.
Okay, most people are back. Let's give people a couple more minutes. Okay, great. I think we're all back. Excellent. Okay, so let's share uh, whoever was the reporter or the reporters. Hey, this is Tyra. So, sorry. No worries, oh. Tyra, go ahead. So um, yeah, so everyone in our group thought that the mentoring program was a great idea. And we had some that did have experience with mentoring okay. and being mentees, um, but a few of us didn't. So our recommendation though, to make this a little bit better would be to have mentees interview their mentors to make sure it's a good fit. Oh. Cause sometimes personalities mm -hmm. just don't really click. Sure. So that was our main takeaway from that. Definitely, yeah. You want to assign people who are mentors and mentees. What we usually do is we try to match mentors and mentees in whatever way. Then after the first meeting, if it doesn't work out well, so when I create this mentoring program for companies, then we switch around mentors and mentees. Okay, Troy, yes, client meeting at 3.30 p.m. Sounds good. Okay, who is next to share? Hey, this is Anthony. Um, yeah. So we agreed, you know, it would be super beneficial. However, there needs to be some type of formalized process to identify the mentor and then, yeah, you know, absolutely. train the mentor who should actually be a mentor. And, and then, you know, what really qualifies mm -hmm. that person to be a mentor? We don't want to lead the, the, the new staff in the wrong direction. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, definitely formalize it and come in from, yeah public accounting, there is a formal process. So, you know, you try to identify what your goals are. Do you want to be more strategic? Do you want to be more tactical? And then they will partner you up with a mentor. Um, however, we have not seen that in, in, in organizations, you know, outside of public accounting, but you know, it, it'll help just define the process a little better. And then someone yeah. suggested, you know, it, it could be a safe place to ask questions. So, that mentor should understand something, you know, like advancement or tuition reimbursement, things like that. They've been with the company for a while. Um, another point is adding a metric to determine that the mentorship program is working. Mm -hmm. So one metric could be some type of survey. Yep. You know, are you are you getting you know assistance from this program? Are you understanding the organization better? Are you getting an understanding of the culture? So some type of feedback would be good. And you know, and the process could work. Yeah, excellent. Yes, whenever I implement this, we definitely have surveys after the first meeting to see if it works well. And then after, we usually run it for about a year. So after three months, six months, nine months, and then a year, we run it and see how things are going. So excellent. you would stay with the same mentor for how a long? A year. A year, one year. Okay. Yes, yeah. one year. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, great. Other groups. Jose, um, yes, Jose. we had a we had we had a discussion again. The mentorship approach, uh, I think, is overall very beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, for my own example, we we have a mentorship program, and a, a person is assigned a mentor when they first onboard, uh, okay. and they stay with that mentor um, until they get uh, certified as a, a an assessor extra, mm -hmm. uh, to do external assessments. Uh, but we also talked about the, the the two mentorship approach, and feel that that even though it's, it sounds good in concept, it mm -hmm. will be difficult to implement. Uh, uh, you know, getting mm -hmm. somebody involved from an external organization, uh, depending mm -hmm. on the size of the organization and how much how much that external group has uh, is familiar with your you know your processes, your procedures, mm -hmm. your objectives to to add value as a mentor. So. Mm -hmm. Well, the goal of someone, yeah, the goal of someone from outside the group is not to focus on your processes, but to help you address those weak times, the weakening of connections from out with those outside of your group. So they are, their goal is to help you build connections outside of your group to help you get learn more about the broader organizational culture, how advancement works, how those dynamics work in the broader organization. So that's the goal, and I've definitely seen it be successful. So you just need to have the right goals and have the right purpose for having someone outside. I agree, uh, but I think it, it it does offer its own challenges as well. Sure, absolutely, it does. Okay, thank you, Jose. And the last but not least. Hey, this is Elliot. Um, Elliot. Most of the uh, things that we had talked about have been mentioned already. Um, it's a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. 
of the slightly different approaches that we had talked about was um, incur or encouraging or setting up um, new hires to have 15, 20 minute chats with various leadership across the company, directors or mm -hmm. you know managers. Um, so like one approach, one of the members on our team had was they would give the new hire the org chart and then highlight certain people, like set up meetings with these folks and talk oh. with them so you can learn about their area. Um, mm -hmm. And so that puts a little bit of ownership with the the new yeah. hire. Um, they are in charge of accomplishing that, you know, pretty simple goal of meeting people. Mm -hmm. It also helps get them more knowledge about the company and helps them, mm -hmm. you know, get buy-in to like, this is what the company does. Not just my, maybe they're just going to be doing help tickets, but now they know, oh, well, I'm helping the marketing team solve their mm -hmm. access and keep things working. And it gets them to buy into the company and how it operates and what it does, you know, as a whole, not just what they're hired to do. Um, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I like that approach. It's uh, not the same as mentoring. It's kind of getting to know you. It's networking, so to speak. Whereas mentoring, you have a mentor who takes responsibility for the success of the new hire, which is really important. Mm -hmm. So there's benefits. But there's definitely benefits. Not the same thing as mentoring, but what you're talking about is networking within the yeah. company. Um, and the, but we were using that to may act as like the basis for now you've met these people. Would you like one of them to be your mentor? Um, oh, okay. Person select based on the people they've met who they could. That's neat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good to hear. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, excellent. Great. So it's three twenty one. So let's take a fifteen minute break and be back at three thirty five. I'll see you then. We'll be there. We'll be doing the final takeaways and then questions and answers.
cutting up in a minute. Okay, good. I hope everyone's back. So let's get ready for the key takeaways and then we'll discuss your individual key takeaways, but the key takeaways more broadly from this inflection on the future of work. And you want to be thinking of this as a key inflection and you want to encourage your leaders, your team members to think about this as a key inflection. But remember back to the beginning, you want to think about this as a framing effect. You want the orienting toward the 90% fat rate as opposed to the 10% fat. So the framing of this is a key inflection, an opportunity to maximize productivity and engagement and address retention challenges. To do that, you want to integrate addressing decision-making cognitive biases into your organization's culture, your team's culture. So bring it back to your team members, bring it back to your manager to the leadership team to the extent that you can to optimize business outcomes in the future of work despite some personal discomfort on their part using a team-led hybrid first model with a minority fully remote will help retain the best talent it will help boost well-being decrease stress increase happiness and maximize productivity all of these things we have extensive data i showed you the data the research on this and you want to adapt your culture to the have best practices for hybrid and remote collaboration, which means virtual co-working, we talked about that, virtually synchronous brainstorming, a culture of excellence from anywhere with weekly performance evaluations and a hybrid mentoring program. To the extent that you have flexibility to adopt some of these methods like virtual co-working, asynchronous brainstorming, some aspects of hybrid mentoring, performance evaluations, you have that ability, you have that power. You can do so immediately at this talk, like Tom did suggesting virtual core working to his supervisor. And this is the key for you to thrive in this key inflection in the future of work. You want to take this information, you want to adapt it, and you want to use it. Okay, now let's go around. And once again, you'll get a chance to share about your key takeaways from the second part of the presentation. So key takeaways from the second part of the presentation. Unmute yourself or I'll uh, start calling on people. Gina, go ahead. Yes, well, uh, one of the things that I really like is this uh, two mentor system uh, mm -hmm. for you know, new or junior staff. Yeah. Um, I think that it would, it would be definitely very beneficial. We have a, a system, a program in place but I think that uh, we're going to take some of these uh, ideas that we discussed even during our um, brainstorming session mm -hmm. with uh, the, the rest of the attendees. Um, I, I really like that. And I, I think um, yeah, I'm going to propose implementation of this. Excellent. Delighted to hear you. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Tyra. Hi. So uh, again, I wanted to <clears throat> highlight the importance of that mentorship uh, piece for mm. the junior people and the newcomers of yeah. and a two-person like you said for the organization and for the team 
Um, and I also like the option to either interview or like you said, have a check-in like one month, three months, six months, that type of thing, just to ensure that the relationship is, is productive on, yeah. on both sides. So I think that's definitely one of my takeaway from the second part. Excellent, great. Thank you, Tyler. Other folks, unmute yourself or I'll call. So uh, Jeff, you are going to unmute yourself? Yeah, I think the key takeaways would be the various techniques for managing folks between hybrid mm. and uh, remote work and to be able to get the most out of everybody. Okay, good. Glad that's helpful. The virtual co-working, asynchronous brainstorming, performance evaluation. Great. Anthony. Yeah, key, key takeaway is incorporating the discussion about their annual goals, but more frequently bringing it into maybe those biweekly and monthly mm -hmm. meetings, you know, have a, a checkpoint, say, hey, where are you at with this goal? And it'll it, it'll help me too, because I remember, like, yeah. you know, my annual goals, I kind of like forget about it until <laughs> the end of the year. It's like, oh, okay, you know, so it would help um, everybody to mm -hmm. stay on the same page. Excellent. I'm glad to hear it. Um, you're listening, Michelle? Clear it will be helpful. Good. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> Jim, you're on mute. Hi. Okay. My take 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 takeaways are this um culture of excellence from anywhere. I think mm -hmm. actually as um, my bias, uh, I guess my um kind of perspective <laughs> when when I thought about this whole hybrid, and so I think this actually changes my perspective, mm -hmm. my bias. Excellent. And then of course I can kind of talk to to my folks and my my managers to to enforce this concept. Good to hear it. Thank you, Jen. Okay, next, Kristen. Um, yeah, I think uh, my plan is to kind of bring um, all of these topics that you've discussed back to my team, and mm -hmm. then probably use uh, the virtual asynchronous brainstorming to then have them, okay, based on this, what other ideas or how can yeah. you see us implementing this into our organization and into our department? So great, You're using technique to help implement the techniques. That's a great idea, Kristen. Okay. Jose? Yes, uh, I, I agree. I think overall, I think the, the presentations will be helpful to the team to kind of have uh, you know, give a, a basis of understanding regarding uh, this approach and, mm -hmm. and how it can work. Uh, I definitely think the um, uh, the tools that you mentioned regarding, uh, you know, collaboration as well as uh, brainstorming, I think will also mm -hmm. help kind of uh, kind of lead us in the direction of, of adding those to our, our kind of uh, tool, tool case or toolkit of things to do for the team. Excellent. Great to hear it, Jose. Thank you. Huh? Yeah, I, I, I guess I was intrigued by this asynchronous uh, technique. So the problem solving, the team decisioning, <laughs> and the things that came up during during that time period. Um, also interested on you had mentioned um, some of the tools <laughs> that you could use for. I, I, I guess I'm calling it anonymous whiteboarding, but yeah. uh, you had <laughs> that is mural. Uh, Mural is a good one just to start with. It's 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 a really useful anonymous whiteboarding tool. You can use it anonymously, so you know everyone, but you can also use it anonymously, so it's quite useful. Mural, okay. Yeah, mural. <laughs> Check All that right. out. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Hi, folks. Ben. Um, yes, perfect. Uh, yeah, so I I liked the. Uh, to mentor um, option, especially for the mm -hmm. uh, newer employees and staff yeah. members. Um, I think it's it will go a long way. Mm -hmm. um, I also like the idea of smaller measurable goals. Mm -hmm. um, if that's through a management meeting type thing or mm -hmm. on an individual basis through the mentorship program, teaching people to have small goals and to feel successful along the way. Um, especially when you're starting into a new project as a newer employee, sometimes it's easy to get overwhelmed and with mental sure. health being the focus of a lot of groups right now, I think that would be beneficial to most teams. Okay, good to hear it. Thank you, Ben. 
Okay, other folks? Wasn't shared yet. Right? It's a shard. It's oh, Charlie. I'm sorry. Charlie. This is. Charlie, go sorry, ahead. Yeah. Right next. Um, I just wanted to. Charlie, you're kind of breaking up. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. I was just saying that I um I got a lot of great ideas from the presentation <laughs> today. I appreciate everybody's input and I appreciate working with everybody today. It was a lot of fun. And uh, I think my biggest takeaway was uh, was uh, getting more familiar with that virtual happy hour that you had mentioned. Okay, virtual co-working. That's it. <laughs> yep, the virtual co-working, excellent. Great, I'm glad that that's helpful. Brian, you had to, you, you unmuted yourself. Go ahead, Brian, and then Elliot. Yeah, yeah, I'm. Uh, I like the uh, brainstorming techniques. I'm going to bring that back to, uh, to my department and implement that. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, I'm also going to mention the mentorship program to my manager. <laughs> uh, you know, company. I've worked with a company for very many, many years. So, and we really haven't. Uh, they really haven't talked about mentorship, or so I'm. I'm really curious if they have, if they, if HR is really thinking about that, or maybe. You know, just get my get some input from my manager at least. So, but yeah, it's been mm -hmm. been a great great uh, workshop. Thank you. You're very welcome, Ryan. I'm glad to, that you'll be bringing the, back the these points and talking about mentoring as well. Great, Elliot. Hey, yeah. Um, so a lot of a lot of good stuff today, and from the second half of the 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 session. Um, mm -hmm. I think the key takeaway that uh, I like the most and will continue to push for and have is the uh, small scale performance evaluations, just to mm -hmm. have those regular touch points um, to stay in touch, aligned and working towards the same objectives and goals and to, you know, make sure that the the team is happy and content and making progress. Great. Thank you, Elliot. I'm glad that's helpful. Good. Okay. People haven't gone yet. Unmute yourself. Susan? I, I think I like the um, virtual team working. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's very helpful because sometimes, you know, you don't have the cubicle to walk to. Mm -hmm. um, also the asynchronous um, meeting, you know, the questions and things like that to get input mm -hmm. feedback, I think is very helpful as well. Great, I'm glad to hear it, Susan. Glad it's helpful. Excellent. Okay, who well, hasn't spoken yet? Michelle, do you want to share? Sure. I think the the mentorship again that we discussed. Um, mm -hmm. Since we're going to be looking to likely add some team members, um, this will be something that we could look into mm -hmm. um, when when we do so. Excellent. I'm glad that will be helpful. Katina. Oh, pass by. Uh, I think Camille, Camille, you haven't spoken yet. Hello. Um, Hello. So I was on for the first half of the meeting and then I had to drop for a few meetings during the second half. So I was gone for a little bit, but my key takeaway that I've um, had so far is I really love the idea of virtual co-working. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Tyra had mentioned virtual happy hours, which is kind of out of, out of what we're speaking of here, but it's similar mm -hmm. and to where we can get more employees or you know colleagues engaged and collaborate with each other, or at least get familiar and get to know each other to where uh, virtual co-working won't be so uncomfortable for um, people. But I think that's my key takeaway. I love the idea and I think I'm gonna try to implement that with my team. Excellent, good. Glad to hear that's helpful. And uh, the virtual coffee roulette, if you're thinking of that to randomly match people with each other for virtual coffees. Good. Okay, so I think everyone's spoken, but let me know if you haven't. And then at this stage, I'll be happy to take any, oh, I should mention, I'll send everyone free additional resources. So if you're watching this and you haven't registered, if you registered, I'll send you the resources. If you haven't registered and you're watching this as a video, go to tanyural.com forward slash DAE event for the resources. But if you've registered, you'll get the resources automatically. So tinyurl.com forward slash TAE event for the resources. I'll send you a copy of my best-selling book, Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. 
and I'll be happy to offer a free coaching session for the first three payments for you and or your team members, managers who will want to implement this in your organization. And I'll send you a copy of the slides as well. So you'll get that. Is Great. the book an uh, ebook? Yes, I'll send you a PDF of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's available in hard copy also if you want to get that. But yes, I'll send you a PDF. You're okay. going you're to you're sign the PDF? <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> All right. So, How do we get the hard copy if we want the hard copy? It's on Barnes Noble. Yeah, it's on uh, Amazon. Just Google the type returning to the office and leading hybrid remote teams, just or and or my name. It's okay. easily available on Amazon. <laughs> okay. Any last questions for any aspects of the presentation? Not last questions, first questions, middle questions, last questions, everything. <laughs> you can chat or you can unmute yourself, whatever is more comfortable for you. You're welcome, Charlene. Okay, don't think there are any more questions. Camille, do you want to share about getting credits with everyone? Sure, so in closing, um, as I mentioned during the beginning of the presentation, I will be submitting for CPEs for those who stayed um, throughout the um, entire course. I'll be submitting for the CPEs and you should receive those in your email within a week. Um, also stay tuned for upcoming events coming up. We do have an event coming up on Jan um, June 29th. Um, and the event will be in regards to AI plus it'll be the West Florida ISACA's annual general meeting. So stay tuned um, in receiving your email on that, which they should be going out on the 8th of June. Okay. And that's all on my oh, end. Excellent. Uh, Camille, I got a message from Troy Riley that he had to leave like a couple of minutes before the end because he had an upcoming Zoom meeting. So just he sent that to me personally. So just letting you know about him about the credits um, yeah so he left at like 329 so it's fine <laughs> i'd like to thank okay. you so much for um your presentation dr gleb it's been a very great presentation i uh, really appreciate it excellent thank you camille and thank you everyone enjoy the rest of your day thank you very bye -bye. much take care bye, -bye. Mm -hmm. okay. you're welcome everyone you're welcome tyra jose Kristen, tom jim glad it was helpful tyra welcome charlene Welcome, and Gina as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome, Tom. Bye-bye, Charlene. Bye-bye, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome.